this is a um, BGP tutorial and we have three hours, but um, this is content that could span a couple of days. So um, you see Tom is nodding. Um, I uh, used to give a training course on, uh, on BGP. Um, similar to this, I cut out a lot of the, of the material out of it, uh, and that goes for two days. So um, we'll try to be a little quick in, uh, in explaining, showing you some, some examples of, uh, of running um, uh, BGP on. So uh, the good uh, diversity you have here is that Tom runs a lot of uh, open BGPD and, uh, and I run uh, BERT and uh, open BGP in some, uh, some environments. So you have both kinds of, um, of expertise. Um, but uh, before we start, I wanted to do some quick introductions <clears throat> with your name, your experience with routing and BGP. And uh, there's an important question is if you have an AS number and um, maybe what your goals are. So um, I will start so you get an idea. My name is Max. Um, I work at the Internet Society. Um, what we do is we help um, part, the, the part of the organization where I work, we help uh, people uh, set up internet exchanges or uh, community networks, or we, we have a part where we run, uh, we have a project where we run measurements and we write about them, uh, all about the internet. So my experience in routing goes back to 2005 or 2006, when I started my own ISP in Italy. And so routing and BGP were my bread and butter daily. Um, now, I still uh, work with them. I still help uh, internet exchanges. Like uh, this morning, I was uh, uh, helping an internet exchange mm -hmm. in, in the Caucasus to um, set up their route servers and, and troubleshoot a couple of BGP issues. And I do have my own AS number. Um, it's 58280. Uh, I, I'm actually talking to you over that AS number right now. Um, and my goal today is to show you how interesting BGP is and how much there is to learn there. So over to Tom. Folks, how are you guys? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for uh, having me. And thanks, Max, uh, for, uh, for all the training courses that you and your colleagues have provided in RIPE. Um, uh, over the years and, and you're continuing to do so in your outreach in uh, ISOC. So I really do appreciate that and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, my name is Sam Smith. I'm CTO of Wireless Connect, a small ISP in, the, in Ireland. We set up with the aim of bridging the digital divide and uh, I'm proud to say after 15 uh, years almost, uh, we're certainly doing that. Um, we run BGP, we run AS62129. Formerly, I had a 32 bit number, uh, it was uh, AS198988, and that we retired that and went with AS62129. So that's our AS number, and I'm also communicating with you through that today. Um, we've used Open BGPD in conjunction with Barista Equipment to deliver, and uh, I'm looking forward to, and I've done a, a previous. Uh, uh, talk actually at the last pandemic 2019 talk uh, 2020 uh, with Dan Langell so uh, and uh, you could check that out but uh, I just want to say that uh, BGPD and BSD based uh, tools have often made my life as an ISP easier and uh, so it's nice to have an opportunity to give a little bit back uh, and I see some other people who have also been on conferences and given back like Jason Tubner, sorry for wrecking your name, I hope, because I, I was doing that to uh, Max all the afternoon. So I'll head back with Max. It's a pleasure to be uh, doing this with you. I look forward to work with you, Anna. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yep. Thank you, Tom. And, um, well, maybe, Jason, your camera is on. You want to introduce yourself, follow the, these introductions so we get an idea of the... You know, I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Jason Tubner. I'm the uh, Senior Security Lead at um, uh, La Trobe Community Health Service. Uh, we're a not-for-profit community health service based in uh, Melbourne, Victoria, our regional 
we are actually originated from regional Victoria, um, but we're we're now state and national wide. Um, my experience in networking uh, is is probably on the medium term, and not not like a, a god or anything like that. I don't have any um, any uh, CCNAs or any of those uh, uh, certifications or whatever. Um, I, everything that I know, I've actually learnt myself, and usually using open source tools like. Uh, OpenBSD is where I originally come from. I've looked into the bit of the free BSD and the networking side, but basically my home for networking is OpenBSD. So um, uh, we are using OpenBGPD uh, for our uh, default route for our AS139466. Uh, so uh, we uh, become a member of APNIC and uh, decided to take control of our network and uh, and attachment to the internet via that network. And we didn't want to be um, beholden to an ISP or the ISP's um, uh, subnet range uh, in the event that we wanted to move. And it also gives us the ability to, to branch out to other peers and other internet exchanges uh, to, you know, optimise uh, our connectivity to the internet. Um, yes, do have an AS number, uh, 139466. And the goals here today is um, to learn the finer details about BGP uh, filtering and eventually get to a point where uh, we can interface uh, our part of the internet to the rest of the internet, similar to what Tom's done with his um, connectivity of uh, his ISP. And that's using route reflectors. And I don't think we're going into that today, but um, it's to understand more because then that way I can glue things together. I've got knowledge on here and here and here, but there's bits that I need to glue together and I want to want to sort of help optimize that. Thank you. So you're in Melbourne, so it's like two or three in the morning, depending on which time zone that is in. Right? Three oh seven AM. Yeah, three. Yeah. Okay. So same as Sydney then. Yeah, that is Sydney. Yep. Yeah, Sydney. I'm We're always all... confused because Brisbane is not on the same time zone, but only for six months a year. So that's correct. I don't they don't uh, have uh, follow daylight savings time. Well, most people are confused at three or four in the morning. Uh, that's why maintenance windows are done at that time. I remember walking in, uh, just a blooper for everyone. You know, it's like, okay, I've shut down all the sessions on router one. And so I need to reboot router one. So I was like, shut down. I said, so, and of course, do not, do not re reboot router two. Do not reboot router two. Two cables. <laughs> Ah. We were too gone, and I'm like, ah. So I think that three or four in the morning, everyone's confused. So appreciate you coming online uh, at three or four in the morning, and uh, don't do what Tom did at three or four in the morning. But there's a reason for maintenance windows late at night to account for the human factor. Yeah. Um, hopefully, Dan will edit that section out of the video because we don't want that online forever. <laughs> He's, yeah. He'll be shaking his head, saying, "No, we're not." <laughs> So this uh, this session is going to run until six in the morning for you, Jason. At this six point. or seven. I thought I thought I worked it out to be about seven because I got to go and give blood straight after it. So it's three hours that's supposed to run. So okay. six. six. <clears throat> okay. Um, um, anyone else who would like to introduce uh, him or herself or themselves? Uh, I see Len, your microphone is open. Yeah. So my name is Len. I'm retired. I mostly worked on um, <clears throat> storage, but I uh, am trying to help a research group uh, that I worked with at one time on how to set up routing. So my hope is I will learn enough to set up routing between multiple um, virtual machines that are sort of off on my own network and not affect the internet until I get enough experience that I can then say, this is what you need to do and how to do it. Uh, at this point, I am starting off at pretty close to ground zero on routing. So uh, take that in mind, please. Okay. 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 For Martin, the cameras, you should see them in a separate um, area yeah. of your screen. Normally. I have a screen, but they are all white. Anyway. Um, oh, okay. 
I have no experience with rooting demons. I have way too many VPNs and private networks all over the place and uh, I manage them by hand. And I'm here to learn whether BGP would be the right thing for me to actually run and automate that. Okay, great, thanks. Am I allowed to nice. say that BGP would really help? Yeah, Especially. I assume so. <laughs> I know, I think it would, oh, sorry. But glad to have you. Is it Martin, yeah? Yes. Okay, anyone else? I see Stephen with camera on. Yeah. Yeah, hi there. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a NetBSD developer and we, <coughs> at my company, we do uh, all sorts of, um, all sorts of things really, all, uh, IT things, but, but we're, we're now getting more into trying to do hosting and uh, private cloud or, you know, sort of uh, niche cloud, I, I suppose. Uh, and for, for too long, we've been beholden to uh, colo services giving us their IP address range and, and things like that and uh, and then when one of their switches fails everything goes down so we thought it's time to fix this ourselves so we so we do have an AS number uh, and we do have uh, a contiguous block of, of IPv4 addresses uh, but at the moment I've, I've we are using BGP but I've built that using uh, ubiquity routers at the moment um, over Four different internet connections spread over two sites. Um, so, I, but I've sort of done done that with help from uh, the people at the Colo. So I, I, I'd much I, I want to learn how to do it more myself. Uh, I, I have built it up and it do, it does work, but uh, I'm sure I could be doing things better in terms of resilience and uh, and things like that. So uh, yeah, I've got uh, got big hopes. I'm going to learn something today. Ooh, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? Um, so, uh, yeah, I've please. rebooted the DN42 network like a decade ago. It's a decentralized BGP-based overlay network between hackerspaces and makerspaces to make the internal resources available uh, to other spaces. And I um, used the skills I learned there to use dynamic routing in my production network, but it's too small to require a public AS number. No network is too small for an AS number. No, but to justify it. No network is too small to justify an AS but, number. Yeah, I, I, what I, am I... And I worked for the registry, and I used to teach how to work with the registry, so... It always it has a bus factor of one. So don't make it any more complex. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only thing I would say is that... Uh, as a network operator, my profound regret, uh, it would be not signing up for RIPE membership sooner. Um, uh, back in the, now, like for people with V6, you could go, there's no, but, uh, you know, you could have more space, but also you get contact with people like Max sooner. And uh, that is like massive, uh, I would have to say, if you, if I would say one of the biggest mistakes is not doing this sooner. But like that said, I can understand, yeah, there, there are some constraints often with companies, but uh, anyone out there who thinks it, it, the only thing I'd say is get it. Uh, and do, um, you know, like, uh, so, um, and, and I really, I really mean that. Um, okay, sorry, I'll continue. Yeah. Because we, 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 we need to get started, Tom, because uh, I see there was an introduction on the chat, which I'm going to read for the people on the streaming, which is uh, from Albert. Um, I have some experience running IT infrastructure and more or less complex networks and some experience with routing protocols, but very little experience with BGP, apart from catching part of a tutorial at, I think, EuroBSDCon some years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, then there are comments about only getting a slash 22. Uh, I also have only a slash 22. Um, and um, <clears throat> Jan, I have the uh, um, same bandwagon as you are, uh, Bird on FreeBSD and BGPD and OSP, uh, well, not OSPFD at the moment on OpenBSD. I run BGP and OSPF on, uh, on, uh, on FreeBSD actually. And then we have Mo. 
Uh, I'm a network engineer with five years of experience providing consulting services to SMEs. I have intermediate experience and I'm working to get my CCMP and JNCIP. So those are the uh, Cisco and Juniper certifications. Uh, never use OpenBGPD or Bird in production. So looking forward to this session. I have previously attended several RIPE meetings and I enjoy being part of this community. Uh, have we met at RIPE meetings then? Um, I guess it's most likely uh, that we did. RIPE 69, yes, I was there. Uh, so um, yes, and IPv6 is where things are. So um, let's get started. Um, I'm going to the slides, which are being shared. Um, let's start with an introduction. I see we have a mix of uh, people who do have some experience with it and some who don't. So um, <clears throat> there is a there's the internet, and uh, it doesn't have. It was built so that it wouldn't have a central coordination. So that it's built so that there are different individuals, different organizations running it in different ways. Um, and relationships are made at what's called an autonomous system level. So the internet was built so that it would have uh, different small entities called autonomous systems that would interconnect with each other and create this larger network that then defines the, the internet. So as you can see here, uh, an autonomous system can be three routers, can be five, can be 10, 100, could be just one router. Um, the definition is just an independent network that uh, runs a certain protocol. Then, And uh, we have a distinction between what's called an internal gateway protocol, an IGP, and an EGP, that's an external gateway protocol. Uh, IGP normally is OSPF, uh, ISIS. Uh, there used to be RIP, which was very common, much less nowadays. There's EIGRP. Uh, the two most commonly used protocols are OSPF and ISIS. Um, while for EGP, there's basically just one. There is B BGP, and that's it. Um, you don't really have a choice. Um, so um, I, I, an IGP gives us reachability and path information within a network domain. So uh, it's normally used as a base to redistribute all the uh, notions about each and every single link inside a, a network, inside an autonomous system. So uh, in the case of uh, OSPF, you on each node, you have the knowledge of all the other interconnections of the other nodes. Um, while the difference with an EGP is that it gives, an, I, an EGP just gives us reachability between different network domains, but it's less detailed than what we see with an IGP. An IGP, uh, I always ask a question to people who know already what, uh, how SPF runs and how BGP runs. And I usually ask this on the second day of this training course, and it's, uh, um, why are we not using OSPF on the internet? And maybe Tom can, can think about this. This is something that because makes people think, and I really like that. It's uh, uh, Mo OSPF replied on 16 bit. OSPF can only read. carry 64K uh, states. So it's a 16 bit yes. that's a state idea. But, so but before, before we get to that, ways. the, the the difference is that we would have to manage such a big database with every single other interconnect that goes on the internet. While in BGP, we just need to know, well, with an EGP, with an external gateway protocol, we just need to know, okay, if you want to reach a destination, maybe shoot your data at that point, and then someone else will take care of, of dealing with it. And uh, nobody, while with nobody knows how to scale link state routing to the internet scale. Exactly, and uh, and the um, um, cost function is not flexible enough to express policy there you go. because yes. you need, yes. for link state routing you have to have uh, um, a deterministic uh, cost function because otherwise uh, you will not converge to the same uh, state. Yeah, yeah, 
you could uh yes but the the point where i where that i usually try to make here is uh, in bgp we just need to know very little information like okay who who should i shoot this data to to reach a certain destination and it's just my my neighbors or i know the i get to know the as path i know okay this data will transverse certain autonomous systems before reaching its destination and and i make my routing decisions based on this uh just handful of information with ospf i would need ospf gets to know every single link in the whole internet so every i would get to have so much information distributed over to me that it would not scale at that level. Then, then comes all everything you just uh, mentioned. But the but, point is, <clears throat> it wouldn't be applicable to to an internet so, level uh, routing. So BGP uses a path vector algorithm, while mm -hmm. OSPF uses a link state database uh, routing. We'll get to that. It's it's next in the in the slides. So okay. it's. Um, so, uh, well, BGP is the border gateway protocol. It's the routing protocol for exchanging information between networks. You can also use it internally to a network, but it's um, it's um, it's um, uh, it's used for just distributing from usually from one edge of the network to the other, and then internally everything is taken care of by the the IGP. So a comment um, from the chat uh, is that the Dijkstra algorithm of OSPF won't scale. Yes, yes, yes. It would be it, it as I said, OSPF would not would not scale. Exactly. So um, for the uh, when we when we look at the single and the small entities at autonomous systems, it's a um, uh, a network controlled by one actor, one single entity, and it has its own uh, routing policy, but also it could be a group of networks. Um, could be a group of uh, different people who go to get together, different uh, organizations that get together and, uh, and then run one single autonomous system. There are different, many cases of this on, uh, on the internet, and then they get assigned a number that is, that defines their autonomous system. These numbers can be 16 bits or 32 bits. Um, unlike IPv4 and IPv6, they are interoperable. Um, there used to be issues because the, the RFC for defining 32-bit ASNs was issued in 2008. And uh, for a few years, some uh, operating systems, some networking operating systems uh, lacked support for it, or people didn't have the money to upgrade their um, their software. So there used to be uh, there used to be issues with handling 32-bit ASNs, and we'll see that there was a at one point it, there was a um, mechanism defined to uh, overcome this limitation. But nowadays, um, every single network operating system supports this. Um, there is one limitation to having 32-bit ASNs that is, and we'll see it later, how you can use uh, communities. And that's why um, at internet exchange points, uh, it's preferable to have 16-bit um, ASNs. But we'll get that. We'll get to that. Um, ASNs have um, some numbers reserved for special use, for documentation, or for private use, um, both in the uh, 16 uh, and 32 bits. And uh, there are special reserved uh, ASNs that are the zero. No one can use that. 65535, which used to be the last one of the 16 bit ASNs. And then 23456, which is the one that's, that was used for uh, interoperability. So in uh, when who you had a, number? sorry? Who picked the number two, three, four, five, six? I don't know. I think uh, that was uh, decided in an RFC somewhere and, uh, and then uh, they discovered it was not assigned yet. So probably it was used that way. Um, the idea was that it would be a placeholder for 32-bit AS numbers. Um, if you had two routers, 
one supporting 32-bit ASNs and the other one not. The one supporting 32-bit ASNs would transmit updates, BGP updates, uh, including 32-bit ASNs, replacing the 32-bit ASNs with AS23456, which led to a series of uh, funny behaviors, but um, it made interoperability simpler for a while. Uh, as I said, nowadays, we are 13 years after the uh, RFC was out. Um, if you find something that doesn't support 32-bit ASNs, it means it's really old. Um, so um, we have a path vector protocol um, with um, BGP, which uh, maintains um, dynamic updates about in with the path information and uses the AS path attribute as the main point to define how distant something is from, from one system to another. So the AS path is the sequence of autonomous systems that a packet would have to, to transit through to reach a certain destination. Um, this is the main um, attribute that we look for when, we, when, when, uh, when BGP has to make its uh, uh, decisions on where to route a certain, uh, certain packet or which uh, route to prefer over another one. Um, there are others, other attributes, and we'll see them later, but this is the main one that distinguishes uh, reachability. And um, one main feature is that normally uh, a BGP um, a process will just discard a path where its own AS is detected, and uh, this means, the, and, and it also uh, prefers uh, the shortest paths, shorter paths. So, how does this work? You have um, a series of autonomous systems and uh, propagation. Um, so BGP propagates information by sending updates to the neighbors. So in this case, D tells C and E, these are my networks. And then C, C and E <coughs> will add their own ASN, their own uh, number in the path and will propagate this to B, or uh, and to F and to the other networks. So this way you create an AS path and you, from A, you will figure out that in order to reach uh, D, you can use either B, C, D, or you can use uh, F, E, D. Or in theory, you could also use B, E, D as a path to reach, uh, to reach D. And then so on. Um, so now announcements go both ways and they go with networks. So um, I used to, I used to, I normally call BGP the market protocol, or we, some other people call it the phone book. I say market because it's like you, you have people screaming to each other. If you come here, you can get these IP addresses. If you come there, you get those other IP addresses. And I can offer you all my a uh, customer cone as a uh, as a BGP announcement. So um, uh, announcements go one way. There's a someone makes a um, announcement like I just said. Come here for these IP addresses, and traffic goes the opposite way. So uh, for both uh, ways, I will always have to consider that traffic goes the opposite way as announcements go. So when I want to receive traffic, I will make an announcement. I will say, here are my IP addresses. And when I want to uh, reach a destination, I will look for the announcements that I received and see how I can reach uh, a certain destination or a certain uh, router and so on. Um, I see... Yes, well, the, um, the comment is if a BGP speaker lacks 32-bit ASN support, it hasn't been maintained for ages and shouldn't be connected to the internet. Yeah, good point. Um, I've done some investigation on looking glasses a um, couple of months ago for an unrelated um, topic, and, um, and I found many, many, many uh, systems that lack 32-bit support. So unfortunately, they are out there. 
Then you have uh, eBGP and iBGP, which are external BGP and internal BGP, which are the same protocol, but um, has slightly different uh, features. What, um, when, when we talk about eBGP, we talk about uh, two peers belonging to different autonomous systems, so two different AS numbers, and um, they uh, exchange uh, reachability information, their prefixes, probably their, down, their downstream prefixes as well, um, and this is where most of the routing policy is uh, applied. But iBGP <clears throat> is when you uh, run BGP between two routers running the same autonomous system. So normally it's used to um, basically bring, um, there's um, the, the best example is you have an edge router that talks to one of your transits, you have your network in the middle, and then you have another edge router that talks to your customers. So what you want to do is uh, if you have customers who want to receive the full routing table from you, you have to propagate that routing table to your edge router that talks to your customers. And in that case, you set up an IBGP between your transit edge to your customer edge router. And uh, the particularity about IBGP is that uh, when you when you set it up, you have to set up a full mesh between all your uh, all your routers, and they have to have the same um, table, the same routing table synchronized between them, because otherwise they will not install those routes in their uh, table, and they will not uh, propagate this that information. Um, there are ways to avoid having to set up too many sessions. Uh, you can have what's called a route collector or a route reflector internally in your network. Um, you, could, uh, you could run other systems that um, it's called confederations if your network grows too much. But um, for the simple network, you can just run IBGP. Um, I have three routers. I run IBGP between them. It's uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't take that much in terms of configuration, especially if you uh, automate uh, those. Yeah, Max, just to give you a breather for one second, with the IBGP there, um, it becomes an N minus one squared problem. So if you have 11 routers, you need 100 interconnects with IBGP to be fully, to actually get it fully synchronized. And so the root reflectors added the confederations. Confederations work because the n minus one squared, you actually just reduce it, you divide a conquer, and you're not having so it's uh, like nine square nine minus one squared is a lot there's a lot more than uh, three times three. But yeah, anyway, move it swiftly up. It's basically it works anyway. If you if you're squaring a problem, it's always bad. So if you could reduce that number size. So with confederation, what you do is you have a group, different groups, and that's how you reduce the mesh size. You keep the best size within that network. Um, uh, yep. As, as long as you're staying within uh, open source routing demons, uh, the n squared isn't that much as, as a problem because it's only linear per node. And if you're using modern server CPUs as your control plane, you have plenty of CPU cycles to spare. So you're, uh, okay. What I will say to you is that it may be linear per node, but as a network, it means managing oh, all yes. the nodes. It's an exponential workload. Um, so, Holy uh, normal, but. but like, it's so I mentioned you, have to, you, you take you the programmer have... hat off and go, someone's managing all of this. And that's the, but it is a, it is an interesting point you make, Jan. And, but, so that's where the IBGP, uh, the root reflectors do help an awful lot. Sorry, Max, I let you back in now that I've given you. No, no, no problem. No problem. <clears throat> but yeah, so the the problem, uh, Jan, is not with the with scaling in terms of the software itself. The problem is in terms of manageability. Um, how you manage, uh, even with automation, having all these, uh, the, the BGP sessions and keeping them up. And uh, so th that is the, the culprit of the issue. But yeah. So uh, getting back to, uh, to our story here, um, the model that normally is, um, 
is operated is uh, <laughs> disabling interactive SSH. Uh, yes, you can, but also even with automation, you you still have uh, you still would have trouble uh, running a, a full mesh of BGP sessions if your network starts growing. Um, that's why that's why we also have um, uh, route servers at internet exchanges. We'll get to that. But like, just think of it like this: a hundred and one routers, ten thousand PHP sessions that you have to keep running and manage. Yeah, not pleasant. Nine is still manageable. Yes, true. true. Still eighty-one sessions. Still eighty-one BGP sessions that you could avoid. Um, so the way the way networks are run usually is that you have an IGP. <coughs> so you have you run OSPF or um, ISIS, and uh, you use that to propagate the uh, loopback addresses of your uh, different routers. And then you run IBGP between these routers using these loopback addresses, because it's um, it's a, a much better way of creating uh, diversity in paths. So you have OSPF, let's say, in a in a situation where you have three routers similar to this. Imagine you have two paths to reach the other router uh, always. And if one path dies, your BGP session is not going to die because it's kept alive by OSPF redistributing the, um, the loopback address over the uh, secondary path. So um, you always use BGP as the, uh, IGP as the foundation, OSPF, ISIS, and then you build uh, IBGP and EBGP on top. Well, focus. So uh, speaking of which, how do we how do we run the different uh, types of networks? We have stub networks which represent from the last calculations I've seen 85 percent of the internet. So networks that are connected to the internet, they don't have uh, they just have one connection or even two uh, multi-home connection, even a multi-homed network, but at the edge of the internet is called a stub normally. Then you have transit networks that provide connectivity to other networks behind them, to one or more, uh, they have a customer cones. And then you have uh, IXPs, which provide uh, a, a point where networks get together and exchange traffic together. So, how does a BGP normally work? You have a TCP connection on port 179. Uh, you exchange routes with neighbors and um, networks are kept in the BGP table. But I want to start looking at first at the um, how we open the BGP session. I'll go uh, a bit ahead and then I'll go back to that slide. We have BGP messages and the first one of them, which is actually the most important well, the, a very important one is the open message because BGP was made to be uh, modular in a way that where, the, where we send uh, an open message. So I set up my BGP router. I say, uh, I want to set up a BGP session with Tom's uh, router. My router will send an open message indicating also all the capabilities inside the, the open message. So saying, here I am, this is my IP address, this is my ASN, and I can speak AS32, I can speak IPv6, I have root refresh capability, I can do this, this, and that. So whenever we want to add something to some capability to BGP, we just have to add it, add the, the specific code to the open message. And it's, uh, it's easily expandable. Now, after the open message, I have keep alive to keep alive to keep the, the session up. And now that's the other important one. That's the update message. Go back to this list. And uh, I exchange BGP routes with neighbors. And I do this with update messages. When I, reach, when I receive an update message, it contains the prefix, it contains the AS path and it contains all the attributes associated with the with the BGP update. I just noticed one thing then. It this oh no, it says that we're live. Sorry, no, that's good. Um, 
the system exchanges BGP routes with the neighbors, exchanges these updates, and then using the attributes, the AS path found in the updates, the system installs them or not in the routing table, depending if the update that it received makes it, makes the, the prefix and the AS path the best way to reach a certain destination including all the uh, specific attributes that are attached to the update. So I receive an update, I look at it uh, when, I'm, when I'm a BGP uh, daemon, I look at it, I, can, I, I check that it's uh, the best path for a certain destination. If it is, I install it in my routing table. And after I've done that, I take that and say, oh, now I have to tell this to all my other neighbors to make sure they also get the best path behind me. And so um, that's what I do. I just uh, add my own uh, AS to the AS path and propagate this information to all my neighbors. Filters, non-filters, then this is a, this is a different uh, uh, topic, but normally I would be telling everyone, there is a new update, you should be using this uh, path because this is the best one. And then I keep my, uh, my session up with keep alive messages to figure out that the other side is still up and running. So then you have, as you, when you're a, a customer, you receive a transit. Normally it's called, I'm getting a transit. It's the way you, you set up your BGP uh, connection. You get the normally the full routing table or the default route, or in some cases you get default plus just the customers of that, uh, of that network you're buying transit from. And what you do is you announce them your prefixes so that uh, you can be reached over the internet. But you can become a transit and then you have downstream networks or network or networks. And again, you can be playing the transit, providing them a full BGP table, with all the almost 1 million routes or just the default route. And you receive from your customer their routes and in some cases also their customers' routes. So you, uh, you build a customer cone with that. And we'll see how this is important later on when we have to, when we look at filtering. And then there's peering. Peering is done with networks at the same level as yours. Uh, usually it happens at internet exchange points, but you could be just running a cable between you and, uh, and the other network. Um, <clears throat> yes, Mo, um, there is, a, um, there is a, a specific RFC that says you have to specify expert routes now, yes. Um, and Job keeps a list of that. Keeps a list of, uh, of all the vendors who implement it or not, yes. Um, He's a bit of a hero. When you, sorry, yeah, I was a bit of a hero. Like, <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> yes. So, peering happens at internet exchanges, and you you normally do uh, you normally set up uh, a BGP session without a specific agreement, without uh, just with a, a handshake to exchange traffic with another network, and that's the real power of either internet exchanges or. Uh, uh, data centers where you can just run a fiber between your ASN and other ASNs and uh, start uh, exchanging traffic. So what you do with uh, with a peer is you announce your uh, your routes and your customers, but you don't normally announce the full routing table unless unless you agree to do it. So what are internet exchange points? Um, if you look at uh, simplifying them, they are just a switch. Um, it can be a very tiny switch, a five port switch, or it could be a very large uh, switching fabric. <coughs> but the goal of an IXP is to get a number of autonomous system networks all in one room, all on the same uh, layer two, so that they can exchange traffic over it. The idea is that this will lower the latency between uh, endpoints. This will keep traffic local. And um, 
And this is why we have at least one in almost any country, every country. Um, they enable traffic to stay local. They improve the efficiency of routing. And um, most of the time they reduce costs. Although there's an ongoing debate between uh, the cost of transit and the cost of uh, peering at internet exchanges, because um, you still have to pay, uh, um, pay someone or buy a fiber or rent a fiber to reach um, a co-location facility where the internet exchange is, but uh, you would have to still pay uh, your transit for reaching you in your own location. So there's a there's an ongoing debate about the the cost, but normally uh, peering at IXPs um, uh, costs uh, less than than transit. And um, uh, well, now just, I would. Sorry, uh, uh, Mo just said um, uh, that there's even remote peering now, but that brings its own challenges. And uh, yeah, you'd be right. Like you, particularly if you're dependent on other people's uh, either. MPLS based network or, you know, uh, or just actual fiber cuts uh, and latency. You might be peered directly, but if you have a huge latency there on are, a big air two span. But there are many networks who just like to say, well, I am at, I peer at uh, 25 internet exchanges and they just do it remotely. And um, which w doesn't have much in terms of, uh, of latency or. Valley. It, they just like to 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 say uh, we have a large number of internet exchanges. And that's it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so normally exchanges um, set up different pops in the same city or across a region, uh, so it's easier for you to reach them. But also, um, in some cases, they have two uh, networks for redundancy or more, or in some cases. Um, different networks with different uh, MTUs, uh, one with the usual 1500, one with the Jumbo. Um, so it differs from uh, country to country, exchange to exchange. And um, actually together with uh, Yob, um, I maintain a list of uh, exchanges and costs and it's at uh, putting the, the the link in the chat that's peering.exposed. It's um, and you can go and check all the costs with all the uh, internet exchanges in the world and uh, the different ports. I should actually update this slide because apparently now it's uh, it's relatively easy at the large exchanges to find 400 gig ports. Um, so 100 gig is uh, is old now, um, although not many uh, really need 400 gig ports. And then we get to a point where, you know, you reach an internet exchange and um, there are uh, very large ones. Uh, if you look at Amzix, if you look at Lynx, uh, DKIX, you have um, about uh, eight, 800 up to 1,000 uh, different other ASNs participating. And as we were saying, the, the, the same concept with... Uh, uh, the IGP, IBGP uh, applies here. Do you want to have a direct BGP session with each and every one of the other participants, which means, let's say, five, six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 uh, different BGP sessions, or would you rather have um, a smaller number um, and then just peer directly with the networks you care most about and then for the others just uh, set up a, a have a way to reach their their prefixes but not having to set up direct BGP sessions and here here's where you get uh, route servers that are really important and actually this is where uh, software routers like software routers like um, bird and open BGPD play an important role because they, they are at the heart of all the major internet exchanges and uh, a route server helps you. You set up a BGP session with the route server. The route server um, gets all the your BGP announcements and replicates them to all the other uh, BGP session it has, but without putting itself in the loop, without adding itself in the AS path. So, and, and then also replicating 
the next stop. So the way <coughs> the way it works is that the route server just gives you reachability information and it tells you, okay, this prefix, talk to that IP address on the peering LAN. This other prefix, this is the AS path, next stop, that other address on the peering LAN. So it it plays the traffic director without getting in the way of traffic actually. So um, in mo in most cases, you you just have to when you when you join a new exchange, you set up your uh, peering with the route servers, and uh, and you get most of the networks uh, peering there. Uh, on top of that, route servers are an important uh, part of uh, of routing security because that's where the IXPs play a role. That's where IXPs can uh, apply their uh, Filters, they can apply uh, ROV. Uh, you can you can configure your communities to to figure out how you want to propagate how you want your data to be propagated and so on. But uh, route servers play a role where you set up a smaller number of BGP sessions and you still reach uh, many of the destinations through the um, through the IXP peering LAN. Um, so it just sets up the next stop as the announcer leaves itself out and the traffic does not flow through it. Uh, many people actually believe this uh, and I've had to explain many, many times that route servers don't get in the way of traffic. So <clears throat> we have seen the basics of BGP. We've seen the uh, how we, how we uh, can work out how to connect to other networks and now there is a section about BGP attributes, which are the heart of the protocol. So every prefix, every update has a number of attributes. Uh, whenever you get uh, a BGP update, there are these attributes, they are, um, they are there and they're used for uh, traffic engineering. So you have different propagation based on different attributes. Uh, at the router level, you have the weight, which is actually more of a, um, it doesn't appear in, uh, in RFCs. It's actually, it was created as a concept by Cisco at one point, but then every other vendor now has it. Uh, at the local AES level, you have what's called the local preference. So whenever you set a certain local preference, and we'll see what this means. Uh, on an attribute, on a, on a prefix, it gets propagated inside your autonomous system number. Uh, then there's the MED, the multiple exit discriminator, that's propagated between your local AS and the neighbor, but not propagated over. And then you have two attributes that are just not limited. They are propagated everywhere unless someone decides to truncate them, which are the origin and the communities. And uh, I would say local preference and communities are the two uh, most powerful ones, uh, most powerful attributes we see here. Um, then you have uh, as attribute the next stop and the AS path, but uh, AS path stays always the same while you can change local preference, you can change the MED, you can influence uh, the MED, you can um, modify communities and change communities to the way you like, <clears throat> while the next stop and the AS path generally are not uh, being touched. Do we have any questions or comments so far before we delve into more of the uh, attributes here? Tom, um, I just, see you just, open. Just, yes, Jason. Um, yeah, just with, because uh, I'm not familiar with internet exchanges, so um, to, to connect to the route server, they, would they issue uh, you a a slash thirty one to connect into their fabric. No, you you would have a peering LAN, and so the peering LAN would be let's say if there was a thousand people on it, it would need to be around a slash twenty two. Um, if it was, and so everyone would have an IP on the peering LAN, effectively. So every IP can talk to every other IP, and it's it's like so the. The root servers then become more like uh, the root reflectors in the IBGP mesh. It's the same problem. You know, you have 100 peers uh, or 101 peers, you need 1,000 sessions. 
to fully interconnect everyone. And then if you have two, you know, if you have two redu redundant routers or two peering lands, which you have, then you have, you know, you're doubling it again. So everyone peers with the routing server and the routing server peers. Uh, and so you just have, you, you only have to maintain the number of sessions. Uh, everyone just has to maintain one or two sessions with two root servers per LAN. And then they can get to exchange the traffic with the other IPs on the LAN. And that's the key thing. So for instance, let's say Google's, and let's say 8.8.8. .8. It's literally like, just go to Google's router. It's over there. That's its IP. Get it there. And so it's just passing that information. It's not actually doing the heavy lo load, uh, uh, as Max was saying. And it's... Um, so it may be necessary uh, if someone here is not yet uh, familiar with it to explain that BGP just transports routing information. So the next hop for a prefix. And you already have to know the next hop. So basically all you learn from the route server is that this prefix is reachable at this cost there. Yeah. How to get there, BGP doesn't tell you unless you're abusing it. And yeah. Mo wants to state from the chat that you can uh, prepend the AS path to deprioritize a peering. So AS path is gentler. It's a, gen it's a hint. Um, I, I think now maybe Max, I'm preempting you, but like for instance, yeah, there, like local there, are, there are slides in a moment about this. Okay, there so slide. Uh, I'll wait for like Max. To... Yeah, <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah we're 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 stepping ahead, but there are slides in a in a, in a bit. Yeah, for the uh, AS path because BGP is a, a um, you know a vector distance vector protocol. The AS path is the purest way of doing it. And at least you're letting people know what way you want it done. Uh, and whether they comply with it is another step. And I'll put I'll hand back to Max there. No, no, it's uh, it's just uh, you know um, <clears throat> AS path, as I mentioned, is the, the 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 I would say not really, but the king of uh, of the attributes. Uh, that's the, the the main one. And then all the others come come with it. But um, in this case, we have an example where you see there's a there's a route propagation. There should have been an animation which didn't happen. But uh, oh, no problem, Mo. Don't worry about uh, about uh, stepping ahead. Of this. I'm here to to help everyone, and uh, I'm here to to make sure we 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 follow a certain path so that everyone is aligned. But that's fine. We can uh, we can keep handle the comments this. common more, please. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I actually prefer having people who comment, comment, and ask questions than rather than having a completely silent room. So don't worry, don't worry about that. Um, as you can see, when we look at AS two hundred. Uh, it has two different uh, entries for uh, ten dot zero uh, ten slash twenty four. One that has a direct path that says 100 and goes this way, and one that says 300 and then 100. Um, in this case, um, the same goes for uh, 300 that has like one, one path uh, direct and one through AS200. In this case, uh, <coughs> um, the uh, AS path selection is. Um, just plays an important role. It says, well, you can either reach it directly or you can take a longer path. And then there are ways, uh, there's, a, there's a section about traffic engineering uh, later on where we see you can artificially make the paths longer to influence how routing happens to, well, for example, um, let's jump a little bit ahead, but let's say AS200 would like to uh, not reach AS100 directly, but uh, because let's say here the tra traffic costs, I don't know, $20 per megabit. There are places in the world where that's still the price nowadays. Um, while going through AS300, it has a special agreement where it pays two per megabit, but then 300 uh, absorbs the cost of sending the traffic to AS100. AS200 could 
configure a, a specific, um, well, it depends uh, on, a, on a vendor basis, but it could say, when you, re when you receive the update for 10.0, blah, 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 from this uh, neighbor, uh, add my ASN first a couple of times. And so you make the path artificially longer to induce the, uh, the process that checks which one is the best route to say, well, okay, if this is three ASs, the shortest one is the second one, this one that goes through uh, 300 and then reaches 100. So I'll use that one and I'll install that route in my routing table. So you can do this. Um, this is part of normal traffic engineering that happens all the time, every single day. Um, <laughs> there are also interesting, um, how would I call them? Accidents that happen with um, people accidentally making AS paths very long. Uh, there was recently a story of an AS path that was 250 something num uh, AAS is long because of course people don't read manuals and they like to just use uh, conf configuration instances as they like and Tom? Yeah, no, there was, um, there was one where they put the AS number in and, it was, uh, and it actually crashed a whole heap of... Uh, that was a very, very funny one. In, that was in 2008. And yeah. I spent the whole afternoon trying to figure out what was happening. <laughs> um, so um, there, there's an operating system. It's a network operating system, or someone likes to call it like that, where uh, in, instead of indicating which how the AS path should be composed, which is common on Cisco and uh, Juniper, you instead tell the system the number of times you want to prepend, you want to add your AS number. But some people didn't read manuals and they just put in their AS number. Now the fields, like the, the, the variable on, the, on that operating system that contains the, the AS number was, uh, of course, um, uh, well, didn't contain the S number, should have contained the number of times to prepend was just eight bits. And then if you took the, the AS number of this organization, you divided it by 250 and 56 multiple times, uh, you would have uh, uh, the rest that was, was 252. So uh, of course the system, or the, the, the variable overflowed multiple times. So the value that was inserted there in the final uh, configuration was 252 prepends. Then that was not the problem. The problem was that no one had tested a condition like that. Oh, that was in 2008. Uh, it was a very tiny ISP in Czech Republic. I'm not naming and shaming, especially because I don't remember the name. No, but um, there is the, well, the vendor is, the vendor is Microtik and they still do this. Um, to be fair, Microtik the, vendor, the problem was Does not Microtik still not the, uh, detect out of bounds values and uh, just performs uh, no. the implicit well, modulo. Now hold no, on. No, we have in we have a different Microtik story defense. now. In we Microtik, have a different story. Uh, in Microtik's defense, I will say uh, that they did the check and they sent it as as it was entered. The problem was that the people who programmed very large, sophisticated routers said, sure, no one would ever send us a cookie. And they were trusting what they were receiving on the wire. Now, that's one part of the problem. But the next part of the problem was what they would do is they would crash, but not before they forwarded it to the next lad to crash him as well. And uh, so on and so forth. So the, so the issue was, Yes, the, you could say that there was a, a user interface issue with Microtik, um, but there was yeah. a core forwarding. Uh, yeah. And <clears throat> there was a basically Microtik uh, triggered, tri Microtik. triggered the bug. I don't blame Microtik for uh, having a slightly quirky configuration, but for truncating input values and storing the configuration with an out of bounds parameter um i'm i'm not i'm well, not sure i'm not sure it was out i think if i'm not mistaken it was 
it, look, it was it, it, balance checking wasn't done by this the other routers, uh, the other brand of routers, which rhymes it rhymes with uh, San Francisco, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that's yes. The one. Uh, so there was no one had tested that before. So if you had an AS path longer than two fifty five, um, the session would just reset, and, uh, and so yeah. But you know nowadays we're having another issue where Microtik has this um, has two uh, ways of doing prepending. One is via uh, set uh, set AS, AS, AS prepending, and then you type the number of prepends, but then you can say set AS path prepend, and then you have to type the exact uh, prepend you want to have in there. Now, what people do is they do set AS path prepend and then put the number of prepends they want to do. So there is an analysis from a colleague of mine who uh, actually figured out that the... Um, AS2, which is University of Delaware, I think, uh, is in the AS path of a number of different uh, networks. But didn't this um, project, uh, did this failure result in a project to keep uh, some quirky road, uh, routes in the BGP default free zone to prevent regressions? So basically, I... always fast the internet as large. Like one of the other um, other quirky <laughs> things is it, two, three, four, five, six. That hack um, allowed for the and people then abused that and said you could announce basically through two, three, four, five, six that it could be validated because it was a two, three, four, five, six is a placeholder for all the thirty-two bit AS numbers. So you couldn't actually validate whether that was the right origin or not. It was like, oh, it's 32 bit. So um, like, I suppose if everyone, act, in fairness, most people in the BGP community act, I think, in good faith, most. And, and usually if there's a big serious issue, it's either a mistake or someone hacked someone else's box, let's say. But it's generally, um, and, and all these, you know, the, the hijacks, like it's hard to, it won't go unnoticed if you hijack BGP. You know, people are monitored 24 seven. And, uh, you know, there have been situations where a large number of routes would have been switched across a different continent on Christmas day, for instance. Um, part of me think, wonders, did someone dare someone to do it for the crack? Or was it probably, I think, Probably a little bit more sinister than that, you know. But um, but like I suppose the beauty about BGP, if I could summarize it, is that you don't just get to mess up your own network. If it goes wrong, you can it could go wrong at a global scale. And people like, in fairness, Job Schneider's, Claudio, Max, who's on on this training, they actually actively proactively work to try and mitigate those. And and that's why Max, I think. I'm going to, you know, that's why you work on manners, you know. But you know that in the past there was um, a day where no one was happy with RIPE-NCC because RIPE-NCC started announcing a new prefix with, as a test with a, with a specific attribute set and no one had tested it before. So um, Basically, half of the internet was unreachable for as long as that prefix was announced by RIPE-NCC. Yeah, it was many years ago, but it happened. And it still could happen. Uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, as we see, AS path is one of the attributes. Uh, then we have weight. That's uh, just uh, internal. Uh, the higher the weight, the better uh, a route is preferred. That's just internal to a um, single router, uh, so it doesn't get propagated anywhere. Um, then we have local preference. Local preference, again, the higher, the better. Um, this is an attribute that gets distributed across uh, routers from the same uh, ASN. And this is um, basically the, the best attribute that's used to influence um, uh, routes that we receive. Um, 
<coughs> and because of course it's something we use internally we have a uh, next stop next stop is uh, is the attribute that tells us how we would reach how it um, through which specific as the name implies next stop the closest stop we would reach a certain uh, destination um, this can be influenced can be changed but normally we trust what we received and then uh, we have MED. MED is pretty particular. Um, so first of all, MED is the lower the better um, compared to local preference and uh, weight where the higher the better, uh, first of all. But second, MED uh, gets propagated between you and your neighbor, but only also it's only used when you have multiple connections to the same other autonomous system. So, uh, Let's assume on the connection between C and A, you have a, say, 10 megabit port, but then between C and B, there's a 10 gigabit port. You want to use uh, C to B. You want to make sure that one is used as primary, and then if something goes wrong, you run on the secondary. This is a very stupid example, but it's to, to show, to tell you how MED would work. Um, in this case, you say you set a lower MED between C and B, so on C going to B, to set to tell B from AS100 send me uh, traffic via this link. It's pretty rare to find um, an another network that honors uh, your requests for MED. Um, one typical example would be Netflix who does, but then I don't know of men, of any others who do. Maybe Tom, you know, some? I think, yeah, I think, I think Google do as far as I know, but it's it like, you know, it, it, once your period, uh, where I see the maybe TV useful is obviously when you're, let's say someone like you're on an IX and you've transit, so you've two paths into them, uh, but you want to go, now the logical path you know, will be obviously use the IX, but often what you find is that traffic engineer dictates that, well, we've a hundred gig pipe with this transit provider, let's dump everything in there. Um, even though a small amount of traffic going on a smaller port can deliver a better user experience. Um, so it, it can be quite useful. But yeah, I know that Netflix do, um, and it's quite common we would you try and announce them a low med for instance on your ix links or on a private peering link back to you max yeah yes yes and uh, then we have the origin which is a mandatory attribute uh differently from med from local pref which if they're not present in an update you consider the um, default values <clears throat> and here, origin has three values, IGP, EGP, and incomplete. And actually, most of the time, you would see incomplete uh, everywhere on the internet. Now, here's one funny, fun, interesting thing is uh, if you get uh, if you get a, 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 a BGP update with IGP as the um, as the origin, it gets preferred over EGP and incomplete. So it was used for a while by certain dubious uh, ISPs to influence your routing decisions. They would propagate uh, routes to you, which were not the best ones, but they would set the, the origin as, a, as IGP to basically trick you into sending them more traffic. And uh, and it was a common trick uh, back then, back in the days. Now, I don't think anyone uses it anymore, but uh, it was a funny one. It was something we we also discovered at one point. But does it would the trick still work on modern configurations and implementations? Yeah. Yes. Because the the um, the decision process is still the same. So. It would still work. It's just that it's well known as a as a trick, and so not it's not used anymore. Yeah. Tom, have you seen it used um, anywhere? No, but I remember looking at it. I would have I would have seen incomplete sometimes, and then you'd see 
usually in fairness, you, you know, you see what should be expected, like internally IGP and then EGP yeah. on the exterior ones. But uh, I didn't see the value, uh, but uh, you would see it in a blend when you were learning routes from different places. But I didn't spot uh, anyone trying to uh, desperately take my traffic over their network, for instance. Yeah, it was a very old trick. Anyway, um, communities. Communities are the most powerful way of uh, you tag traffic. And actually with communities, what you can do is you can influence uh, routing decisions in other networks because uh, communities are transitive. So it means they get uh, propagated everywhere. As long as someone, as long as no one uh, decides to strip them out of the uh, of the uh, uh, next update, normally you see communities set up as AS number, column, and the value. Now here we have a problem because communities are thirty two bits, and now we've seen that ASs now are also thirty two bits. So. That's why I mentioned that when you have a 32-bit ASN, you uh, might run into issues in setting up communities. What about 48-bit extended communities? We are getting there. It's the next slide. Well, there was extended communities, but uh, I removed them and then there's large communities. So extended communities would be used for EVPNs and uh, for MPLS basically. But the, the standard now, uh, one of the standards for the internet now are large communities, which are 96 bits. So you can have a 32-bit AS number, a 32-bit function, and a 32-bit parameter. So the way you normally use it is um, uh, your AS number, instead of the function, you put the AS number of your neighbor and then the parameter. And what can you do with communities? Communities are used for telling the other um, network, please raise the local preference uh, on, the, on the prefixes that I'm tagging here or prepend something at, uh, and make the AS path artificially longer for these prefixes because I don't want to use you as my transit for these networks, but I want to use another one or any other thing. So I can easily um, influence routing in other networks. And uh, many uh, transit providers, they publish their communities to influence their, uh, their decisions. Um, route servers at internet exchanges do the same. Um, so you can say, I don't know, please, uh, route server, do not propagate this prefix to this specific ASN or do not propagate this to anyone or prepend it before you propagate it to everyone and so on. So um, communities are really um, <clears throat> uh, functional and really simple to use in many contexts. So how do we use the attributes that we have seen so far? Now we do traffic engineering, we can do it uh, to manage capacity, um, make sure quality is of a certain level, manage the costs, or uh, also recover from failures. And um, there are two ways. You can do intra-domain traffic engineering, which you can still do with the same exact attributes, but that's easier because you control the whole network. So you know the, the reliability or you know the cost of all the paths. But inter-domain traffic engineering, so between you and other networks, it's not as easy. Because, um, well, luck, because of scalability, BGP has no metrics, capacity, or cost. Uh, that's something you have when you actually instead look at uh, uh, IGPs. Um, but um, um, BGP scales, BGP helps us... Uh, keeps everything simple. And, um, and you have to consider when you do inter-domain traffic engineering that uh, there is a small number of ASNs where most of the traffic uh, is transited through uh, the tier ones. And uh, depending on the country where you are, you have uh, a, a small subset of uh, points in the country where data passes by. Um, 
here in uh, in Switzerland where I am. Uh, there is a Swiss IX and there's a, another tiny exchange that's called CHIX. But most of the traffic you can expect it to go through Swiss IX. And then there's a a uh, small blend of network operators where you can assume your traffic will go through. There's a, in the previous session, we, someone mentioned init seven, init seven is one of them. Um, you, we could mention uh, hurricane electric for IPv6 and so on. So you can make some assumptions and then you have the BGP decision algorithm. Um, a BGP router receives new destinations from neighbors, receives updates. And at, at that point, as, we, as I mentioned already, the protocol, the daemon needs to choose which one is the best path. And uh, it has to install normally. Here we say only a single path to reach a specific destination is needed. In most of the cases, your um, BGP speaker will just install one route per destination. There are cases where you could have more uh, and you could do what's called ECMP. We mentioned it in the, in the previous session, but not for now. Um, so we need to figure out which one is the best path to reach a certain destination. And uh, we base everything on attributes. So we have these attributes. We have the AS path, we have the MED, we have the local preference, we have the weight, communities. Based on this subset of information, we need to figure out which one is the best. And then once we have the best, we propagate this to, to neighbors. Nice. So I'm, we have to, oh, yes. I was just gonna add in there and it's actually neatly tying in with this, that you have, the, you have a BGP decision algorithm, but then also you have your route, your forwarding information based algorithm. Um, so you still have your longest prefix match. So even if you prefer um, a prefix, um, and that's where, you know, and this is utilized by people hijacking prefixes on the internet. And I think maybe Max will be discussing more in depth later, um, but also with the uh, remote triggered uh, black holes, as in black hole routing, when you have a specific route. So even if you're learning it, a path from external uh, source, if you have a very specific route that say, I don't want this traffic, that will take precedence. And likewise, someone saying, I want to harvest the Bitcoin wallets on this IP address uh, every so many hours. And there was uh, a, no a number of documented cases of very targeted prefix hijacking just to hijack the wallet uh, transfers between a mighty pool and uh, whatever they call it that actually picks up the... Uh, the um, uh, I, you know, uh, the actual mining pool uh, data. So, yeah, I'll hand it back to you again. Sorry, Max. No, no, don't worry. Don't worry. Actually, as I as I already mentioned, um, but I see we have new people on the on Zoom here. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, either raise your hand or write it in the chat. Just speak up. And uh, I'll we'll be more than happy to answer all the all the questions you come up with, if we can, if we know the answer. <clears throat> so, um, what is important here is to know that there is, as uh, as Tom was uh, was mentioning, you have the BGP table, uh, you have the uh, BGP decision process, and we'll see that in a moment. But this creates best paths which then get merged into the routing table together with uh, what are called the other routing protocols. And then from the routing table, you decide the best paths. Now, this is an oversimplification of the process because as you can imagine uh, in routers nowadays, there are more, uh, even more uh, sub tables and there are more, um, uh, well, I wouldn't call them queues, but there are um, um, more places where you could find routes that, for example, have been discarded. There is the there is a filtering you you will uh, set up between the BGP table and the routing table, and uh, you can have uh, different uh, you can have access to all these filtered prefixes to see what happened, when when it happened, why. And so 
this uh, scheme you see here is simplified, but it gives you an idea of how you go from BGP information to the routing table to then the forwarding table, which is basically the part where you you in uh, you create entries in your uh, uh, in a, in a, in very fast memory on the routers that then helps you just uh, just forward packets very fast. And then uh, Tom, yes, you you're also adding VRFs, but VRFs are just uh, a uh, yes, routing domains, uh, routing domains, VRFs, uh, VRFs are, are just a duplication of this actually with different, uh, um, uh, routing tables. Um, yeah. and an important distinction though, with the VRFs versus what we what Max has been predominantly talking about is their decisions. What Max and I have been talking about here are decisions within one domain. It's like, which is the best route to forward this packet? Really, that's the question. But with VRFs, it's about separation of traffic. And it's, you know, uh, okay, there's leaking and all that. But effectively, it's it, what we're all talking about here is just within one routing domain, what's the decision-making process? And then the VRFs are effectively just a multitude of it for multi-tenant private routing, typically is one of the reasons why you would do it. Um, but at least Actually. in OpenBSD, uh, uh, the primary routing domain can have multiple routing tables. And there can be additional routing domains, which are a single routing table and some interfaces. So uh, <clears throat> this is tricky because our tables and our domains have always confused me. If you, if you could take it that the routing domain is the main uh, uh, if you could, uh, a domain, let's say, the area of operation. Um, where it's useful is, is multi tenant scenarios, typically. Uh, it is also useful in root servers, which Max might talk about later on. But for, let's say, as an ISP, if you were doing remote WAN services for multiple enterprises, is the ability to carry multiple routes uh, for totally different that would never need a decision in common. It's typically what you're talking about a VRF. The, the OpenBSD R domains, for example, are useful if you have to have multiple RFC 1980 uh, networks and avoid collisions between them for multi-tenancy. Yep. Yes. And, and R domains can be used also, but you will probably use multiple R tables to express policies at the kernel level and OpenBSD uh, violates his uh, concept a bit like most other Unix operating system because the kernel routing table is a forwarding table and uh, routing information base stripped down, but the routing demons have their own routing information bases as well. If you have something like BERT, it can yeah. have dozens of reps in the user space which aren't synced to the kernel. I'm going to defend my tribe for a second there and just say, in terms of, uh, for all the different systems I've used, like uh, in terms of routing domains and stuff like that, I would have to say the syntax around routing domains in OpenBSD is profound and is extremely, like if you try, let's say if we were to compare this with Linux, with mangle rules and routing tables, oh. and, Oh my God, it's it's absolutely it's frightening. Now I'm not I'm not casting aspersions on uh, the other operating systems, but what I found is, uh, and this is something that actually I wanted dearly wanted to talk about in the previous session, is a lot of our production facing servers, for instance, our DNS servers and our, our mail servers and our BGP routers, all the public facing services. So if you were an internet router, you do need to talk to BGP to other routers. So they're all listening in our domain zero, the internet domain, right? But then I have all my management services like SSH, SNMP, whatever the hell, that's all on a different routing domain. So it's like, a, the routing domain is like having a, an operating system with a completely different independent view of the internet. And so what you'll find is that my BGP routers, when they want to update their NTP, they, as far as they're concerned, there's no private IPs in the core of our uh, BGP routers from in routing domain zero. But then obviously we have a management interface to them. 
and that's listed on a different R domain has the and the services operate on that. So if you do a port scan on my box without any firewalls or anything like that, they're completely they're almost completely separate. They are completely separate. Um, yes, of course. And and if that, you're doing it, if your operating system is doing it correctly in R domain or what OpenBSD calls an R domain, yeah. uh, is an almost complete instance of the network stack yeah. with its own interfaces, either connected through those or through, especially in the case of OpenBSD or FreeBSD, I don't know about Linux, in the case of those two at least, through special uh, pseudo tunnel interfaces to connect to routing domains or VNet instances yeah. in FreeBSD's case. And in fairness, that's where packet filter comes in, the PF. That's where it doesn't have to. No, no, no. You say this when you're trying to mix, like when you're talking between the domains and stuff like that. But ultimately, yes, but you can operate without them ever talking. It used to be that you had to use PF to uh, get traffic from one routing domain to the other. But there's a pseudo interface where you can put one end into one routing domain and the other in the other so that each like a pair. Half of this pair um, connects the routing domains via routing, so you can cross routing domains without PF, which is like, a lot cleaner. It, it is like the uh, recirculation interface that you'd have on uh, pre previous generation kind of uh, uh, a data center routers or switches. In fact, you'll often see where you would have you know, these, these virtualized routers, and you'll see a weird thing where the router will have a cable plugged back into itself. It's looped back in. And as you, you know, maybe a management interface routed into a VRF onto the actual, to talk back in band for an out of band management, uh, which is a bit weird because you're actually putting an out of band management interface back in band for the service provider. It needs most as the fellow says, but, but uh, I, we're probably digressing. We probably could discuss this over a cup of tea while Max takes a break. Sure. Yeah, I was I was going to suggest we take a five minute break. It's not not only for us, but also for uh, people uh, participating here. But so, but mainly for us. Mainly for yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you in a few so minutes. We'll be back in five minutes. Yeah. We'll leave the mic open. You're welcome to discuss ideas and exchanges here while we're having tea. It's an open house. Um, in that case, one of the uh, usual gotchas with OpenBSD PF is that, uh, with OpenBSD R domains, is that you always need a default route in each uh, routing domain. Because the first lookup happens before you decide on a routing domain, and if you get a route lookup result, the traffic is discarded.
Okay, someone's asking something. Oh, open base. Pay says, yeah, pair, yeah. So yeah, the the pair interfaces are looping back is a way you can deliberately leak between domains. So you can have one router routing traffic back into the interface of another router routing domain on the same router. Uh, that's as about clear as mud. I might do a sharing session for that. Actually, am I a presenter? Uh, oh, yeah, I can do share screen. Okay. Can I just open up Notepad? Lads, keep uh, the questions coming into chat. Hope you're all enjoying it as much as I am. Um, Max, yes. I'm, just, I'm going to just share the screen for a minute, if you don't mind. Okay, let me stop sharing mine then for a second. Go ahead. Okay. So I just wanted to point out, this is just, um, it was actually a lab diagram, but I, I kind of hacked this a little bit. Just So sometimes what you can have on a router, what Jan was discussing there is where you loop back. So you don't necessarily need to use the firewall. So you can keep routing. Routing domains are pretty pure. It's like, like if you put an interface into a different routing domain, the old routing domain knows nothing about it. The exception would be the Packet filter firewall can provide some what we would call leaking services for it, but I'd have to say I would have to say that the leaking with the between routing domains <laughs> with OpenBSD is counterintuitive. Um, and what but what you can do, particularly with the multi tenants, is usually what you want to do is keep each customer's private networks away from each other. That's generally what you'd use routing domains for. So you want to just make decisions of routing within that domain and not leak beyond. It. Sure. Uh, but, then, but sometimes you want to leak from their WAN, you know, to the internet. Um, and so in that case, you might have a public part. So what you could actually do is, let's say this this routing domain, we may want to actually go back into. The, so this purple or pink uh, cable, we may actually want to route it into our main router, which is actually a black. Uh, black cable or black routing domain. And so in this case, what you're actually doing is in the old routing domain, you, you have an interface, let's call it vertio one and you say default route is going to this IP address here. And you send the cable, you literally take the cable out of that interface and plug it into an interface on the other, uh, on the same router, but in a different routing domain and you can loop it back through that way, and it becomes just a normal routing decision. And in fact, it, you know, 
the recirculation interfaces that you would see in some complicated routers uh, implementations allow you to do that. It's also usually used for encapsulation, like VXLAN, stuff like that. But it, it, is, a, it is an important trick. And what uh, Jan was talking about there is the pair interface is effectively like, a, it's like a patching lead between two, two interfaces that you can just connect them and do that type of routing decision. But I can of have to disagree with your visualization because I, I consider it a lot more useful to treat each uh, OpenBSD R domain as its own, own router. Uh, and, and it, conceptually, yes, it and instead of one uh, router looping back to itself, because no, no, the no, control no. plane and interface logic is uh, Very, partitioned per routing domain. Yes. So what I would say is, let's say that cable there. But right? For example, if you have a service you want to share between routing domains, let's say you have a GPS synced NTP server there and you want to make it available to every customer. Yep. Then sure, you could put it on the, on the system and then just route this prefix to them. So, yeah, so like, well, in that case, let's say you had a, a let's say some sort of web service, let's for instance, like okay. your account, accounts package, like that could just be in a default route out of the routing domain to another router, and that would achieve that. And so uh, and that's what, it, so what I was trying to explain there was that with just routing decisions within the routing domain, you could push traffic out an interface of one, of one router into another router, which is what you would normally do within any routers. But with, route, with different routing domains, you can actually then use an interface and a loopback cable. Like if you just put a cable looping back into the router, you can use that as a way of linking between two different routing domains, like physically, like just a simple routing decision. Um, and the pairs interfaces allow you to do that as well. So I wasn't talking about mixing. I was actually like literally, if I was, if you can see here, like when I'm routing traffic out that, I'm still in that, once once I'm still on that interface, I'm still on that routing domain. Then the cable, it comes out the cable and in another interface of a different routing domain, it, it's actually, it's just being received like a normal routed packet within that other routing domain as well. So, but I, I don't want to labor the point too much, but I was just trying to, I suppose, point out where, you know, as you were saying about the pair interface being a useful way of selectively leaking or routing. It's actually routing. You're really, you're not leaking, you're actually routing the traffic between two different routing domains uh, based on some policy. Um, you got, uh, went a lot further than I uh, expected. Be All I wanted to say was that there's a cleaner solution because it used to be that you had to use PF rules to take packets and flows and assign them to uh, cross routing domains. And there's still a lot of documentation out there which you can run into, which only documents the old and cumbersome way of uh, qu crossing routing domains. That's a, that's a fair point. Uh, but, uh, and it's actually the biggest mistake I would have made using OpenBSD was read, you know, when they implement a new, uh, new software and they say, oh, we don't support X. And of course, that might have been in 2004, they didn't support whatever X was. And as uh, Peter, Peter Hessler once said, yes, Tom, we do add features from time to time, <laughs> you know. So, and, and this was the biggest thing I could say to anyone who's new to BSD or OpenBSD or FreeBSD or anything like that, for any given operating system, if you look at the manual on the local system, particularly if you're diagnosing a router in the middle of a data center, you have much, uh, you have restricted internet access. The manual page on that router will be specific and re relevant and, and valid for that particular version of operating system the router is running. And you can be, I'm going to pretty much say you can be guaranteed that it's accurate. Um, you know, I, the, the standard documentation there is good. Uh, and if I could, if anyone could take one thing from this, is that uh, 
check out Max's uh, ripe uh, trading materials from before. But when you're actually applying it on a BSD router, look at the manual pages because for that particular version, particularly if you inherit a BSD router from another engineer uh, and it may be running an older version for whatever reason, the manual pages on that router will be absolutely accurate, should be, for that particular router version that you're running. Now, Tom, uh, I would like to go ahead with the rest of the presentation because we're one third into the slides. Although we do have, honestly, a couple of topics that we could just uh, jump in the in the slides, but... No, I think I, I'm happy enough to, uh, please, uh, I think everyone, so I'll just stop the share now. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen again. Um, I'll actually hold on. I just see uh, Deb Drub there. Deb, uh, sorry, haven't seen him in a while, so I'll just let us say hi. Yeah, I'm here. Good to see you again. Here we go. And uh, the best path calculation works by um, first dropping um, the the update if there is the, uh, the the your own ASN in the AS path. Uh, <clears throat> then first look at the weight, then local preference, then the shortest AS path. So you see that we have uh, two uh, ways of um, influencing the uh, best path calculation before we look at the AS path, although. Weight is not considered in uh, RFCs. It's only considered in, well, in real life in the end, uh, because it's something that was added after that, and it's a vendor added uh, feature. So we would only have local preference by looking at the RFCs. We have AS path. We prefer the IGP origin, um, the lowest MED. We prefer eBGP over IBGP. This is to send out packets as quickly as possible out of the uh, autonomous system. Then uh, we have some tiebreakers. If everything is the same up until now, um, we, we match the path with the shortest uh, next stop metric. So the minimum cost for, IBG, for IGP. Or uh, at this point, we start looking at uh, funnier things, I would say. So. Let's look at the oldest received path between the two. If there's something that's already there, let's leave it. Um, if we received paths at the same time, then we look at, uh, at the lowest uh, router ID. So it's um, an ID that the routers uh, communicate. Uh, it doesn't have to be an IP address or, uh, well, it usually is the IP address of the loopback interface of the router. And then, um, if everything is still the same, then we pick the packet, the path from the lowest neighbor address. And this is the real tiebreaker, the final one. So as you can see, we start with uh, something simple, the uh, remove the S path. Then we, there are two parts that we can influence. We, can, we could influence also the AS path. That's, uh, that's also true, but uh, internal to the router, internal to the AS, uh, the AS path, and then the MED that's, uh, as we said, in propagation between us and the neighboring ASN. And then we look at uh, other uh, information, EBGP over IG IGP. And then uh, we have some tie-breaking rules that are usually not uh, needed, but they are there to make sure at one point we make the decision to get one best path, uh, and that's it. Then um, we have the administrative distance that goes into play. Uh, this is also uh, vendor specific. So uh, different vendors have different um, values, but this, is, this has nothing to do with the weight. This is uh, <coughs> some, uh, as, you, as you, I don't know if you remember, but we have the BGP decisional process. And then after we have the best path in BGP, those routes get into the routing table where they get mixed together with uh, other routing protocols. And uh, the administrative distance helps us, helps the router in figuring out which path is the best based on which protocol it comes from. So 
when you have a connected interface, the uh, administrative distance is zero, but then it grows. And you see that there's eBGP before the IGP and before IBGP, which means that um, whenever we have to make a decision between taking a packet and basically sending it out, out of our own AS10 as quickly as possible, we do it rather than redistributing it, re, uh, routing it internally in our own ASN. These values, these different uh, routing protocols and their associated routes get put into the routing table and then the best one, the best ones make it into the FIB, that's the forwarding table. That's the very fast uh, memory you have, uh, very fast lookup memory you have in your routers to uh, to do just a quick lookup, figuring out which out of which interface to route certain markets. Then, how do we do traffic engineering? We do it with either more specific announcements. In this case, if I announce a slash 23, uh, if I am AS, AS100, I announce the slash 23 out of uh, out over to AS200, that will attract much, much less traffic then the two separate slash 24s I'm announcing over to AS300 because the more specific announcements always win. And so um, in some cases we say here, it's considered rude and often filtered. So there are many network uh, networks where if they see your two separate uh, slash 24 announcements coming in, and they see a covering slash 23 also coming in. So AS100 in its routing table will most likely have both the slash 23 and the, three, and the two slash 24s. Um, some networks will drop the slash 24s and will just <coughs> keep the slash 23. So in some cases, this uh, trick for... Um, for um, um, uh, your... Uh, so uh, for your traffic engineering, you you will have to keep this in mind. Uh, Matt, um, yes. Deb, Deb Drob uh, just asked, um, is the fib a lie question mark? And you put a smiley face on that. A fib a lie. How do you consider that a lie? So how would you consider that a lie? Actually, now I know what he's saying. Uh, forwarding information. He said, is a fib. Like it's a slag. Actually, I would have to get it out. All right. It's basically fib is like telling fibs. It's like telling lies. It's a slag. Sorry. I uh, am not that, a native speaker. And I didn't yeah, yeah no, I'm sorry. a native speaker. And I'm after reading it out like a... Thanks, Deb. You can't be <laughs> lovely. All right. Move it swiftly on. <laughs> okay. Let's move to AS path prepending. Although we have already mentioned this. You artificially make your AS path longer and uh, thus uh, influencing the best uh, path decision. In this case, um, let's say uh, sending, uh, well, receiving data via AS300 uh, is more expensive than it is via AS200. You just wanna keep it as a uh, backup path. And uh, so you artificially make the path longer to AS300. You do path prepending. And uh, this way, the uh, BGP selection algorithm will be tricked into thinking it takes longer to reach that uh, that ASN, and um, it will pick AS200 as the preferred. And same will do uh, with AS400, because AS400 will see that it's the two ASs long, the uh, well, three ASs long, the, the path to reach 100 via 300, and two AS path long, to reach 100 via 200. So this way, um, you just uh, you just do a local configuration that uh, puts your um, influences like the, the BGP path selection algorithm to to think um, certain paths are longer than other. You can do it with communities in other ASNs. I mentioned it already as well. So with communities. Um, you can control uh, different aspects of, uh, of routing. You can uh, control your neighbor's uh, local preference for a specific prefix. You can uh, tell your neighbor to do prepending. You can black hole your traffic. You can color your traffic. So um, 
for example, you could uh, uh, be connected to a certain internet exchange or to another, and then tag all your all the prefixes you receive via a certain internet exchange with a dedicated community, so that then you can filter also based on the communities uh, going out. Um, by uh, Shane, sorry, you have to leave. Um, so you you have um, you have communities that are a very powerful tool to also influence routing at other exchange uh, in other networks. In this case, there is a very well known community. Well, it's a it's a it's a community that's defined for everyone. It's called No Export. You announce something to AS two hundred. You tag it with a No Export community. And basically, you're telling AS200, do not re-announce this to anyone. So the internal BGP process will just refuse to do that. And this is a, um, a defined community by RFC, by RFCs, and the behavior is also, uh, well, should be enforced by uh, this same RFC. It says, do not do that. Um, how can you it's use a... communities? Yes. It's the list of well-known communities or functions uh, for communities. Yes, there was the link in a previous slide. Um, let me find it. Um, there you go. It's um, it's uh, there's a link from Ayana. I can copy paste it into the chat. One second. Uh, course uh, to ah, here it is I am paste it into the chat uh, link because of course you can't just copy paste it out of that and I'll paste it into the <clears throat> here you go Someone else did it, anticipated me. Okay, um, where are we? Here. Voila. And I'll start sharing my screen again. Here we go. So you can, uh, this is an example of how you could use communities with um, uh, specific tags and colors. Um, this is with normal communities. With large communities, it becomes even, even easier because you have uh, a much bigger um, uh, address range to, to use. Let me go here. So as you can see, some of the uh, well-known communities, there's the no export, there's the no advertise, uh, no export in subconf, conf, which um, assumes the other ASN uses confederations and uh, do not advertise to peers, so no peer. So these are some of them. <coughs> the documents that I linked to has way more, uh, well, way, some more. Uh, yeah. There's the black hole community, there's the there's no export, no peer, uh, route filter v4, route filter v6. Uh, there is a nice new one that is the graceful shutdown. So oh. via communities, I can tell my neighbors, uh, I am going to turn off my BGP section in a bit um, and because of in, maintenance. And but in OpenB2BD, you can do that by when you say B2B CTL neighbor shutdown, then you can type a random message afterwards, like saying, Tom's replaced the router that you should have done two years ago or two weeks ago or whatever. So you can actually just say, I'll be back in 10 minutes. If not, wait a bit longer or something like that. But you can actually put in that random string literally at the end and it's 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 transmitted to the other person's router. So yep. it appears in their logs. So when they see, oh, why does that session go down? Rather than them having to look at it, they can go, oh, Tom Sweet, oh, that's clearly someone. You can actually send a message so that it can be picked up by their auditing systems and logging systems and save them hassle. So it is really uh, a kind of a nice feature. So it's literally, you just, it's free text after the, you know, it's in, it's in the shutdown command. Um, another thing, and I think Max is getting onto it, but 
when you're peering with a particularly larger providers, they will have a series of custom communities, like for instance, like country of origin and stuff like that, um, which they're sometimes used to like uh, doing filtering. It's not really filtering, but sometimes it's prioritizing what, what traffic you want to learn from a particular transit provider. Um, and it's also useful in, uh, in DDoS situations where you can say, right, we'll just keep the traffic local and we won't learn anything else. So um, uh, it is a, it, it's one thing is just look at the Peary manual from your providers. And it's usually in their onboarding kit, but they usually have some very useful community set which can help in the event of DDoS and stuff like that. And, oh, yeah, the battleships uh, with uh, just BGP, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, it is, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really, uh, really impressive uh, way of just get more information. And, and like the graceful shutdown is a pretty, pretty, pretty good example yep. of it where you can actually uh, use it to uh, minimize disruption to traffic jury maintenance. Yes. So um, in the previous uh, session, the one about PF, we also talked about ECMP. And um, ECMP could rely also on what's called BGP multipath, where you you uh, set up a, there's a configuration uh, entry where you tell the, your BGP router maybe a try to accept um, uh, different paths for the for the same um, prefix although there's a there's a requirement that all attributes must be the same so local preference MED um, um, also the the, the 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 path but also not the next stop I think there are exceptions and um, and then you would have multiple entries for the same destination so you can do you can load balance and then there are other uh, protocols that come into play but um, BGP multipath deserves a mention in uh, in here so uh, we have looked at the uh, basics of BGP. We've gone from the basics to the attributes to doing uh, traffic engineering. And then we have uh, the biggest part of dealing with BGP is actually doing routing security. Because I don't know if um, many of you know, but uh, BGP was designed on a, well, a piece of paper like this in, in a bar, basically. And... Uh, the what they hadn't thought when they designed it but purposefully was they didn't add um, uh, security the problem is that any network can announce any ip prefix so um, i could decide at one point um, that i don't like tom and i want to take over his ip addresses and i could just try to announce them um, how can I be stopped? Inside BGP, there is no built-in security. There is no way to verify that I'm announcing someone else's IP addresses, at least built-in into BGP. There is a way using um, external databases. We'll see that in a moment. But the issues that this can generate, it's like someone might make a an error like a uh, fat fingering or the two and three are really close on our keyboards or uh, in some cases you have misconfigurations and uh, or you have boxes that are supposed to announce something one direction and they announce something another direction um, th these are very famous actually um, or things that you see which are like oops um, um, I configured this, but I didn't want this to go over the public internet. Um, if there's a if reason. you ever use BIRD, BIRD pipes uh, with the right kind of filters can be a great way to strip the uh, RS path from routes. And they don't have the scaling limits of OSPF redistribution. So it will happily claim to be the center of the internet. <laughs> Basically, all, all kinds of, uh, every, every router can just do that. Um, 
it's just easier with a software router, but true. Um, anyone can claim to be anyone else. And then there, are, there is a whole, uh, a whole series of malicious attacks that can be brought up with, um, with BGP. So there is one very famous incident. That's the uh, Pakistan Telecom uh, against YouTube. Uh, that was in 2008. Pakistan Telecom wanted to block uh, YouTube in the country, inside the, their country. Uh, they So they generated more specific um, BGP announcements to black hole the, the content to YouTube. YouTube at the time had a slash 23. So they announced uh, two separate slash 24s. Um, it didn't go well because as soon as they configured it on the routers, the routers started announcing it to their upstream as well. <clears throat> their upstream didn't have any filters configured, so it propagated it to everyone because everyone believed, well, you're a tier one, you should have filters, you know what you're doing. And so what happened was that for a couple of hours, YouTube was um, seemingly originating their traffic all, uh, well, pro propagating their traffic from Pakistan. Um, there was a recent um, similar um, issue with Twitter. Uh, someone in Russia was trying to uh, black hole Twitter. They did the same exact uh, thing that Pakistan Telecom tried to do back then in 2008. It didn't go well. Um, the difference between Pakistan Telecom's uh, issue and the one with Twitter um, was that for when it happened to Twitter, it was a couple of months ago, um, things were... Uh, mitigated by RPKI. And I have a section on RPKI later on, but it's um, RPKI managed to keep uh, the number of affected ASNs much, much lower. And we'll see that. Uh, the second uh, incident uh, that we usually uh, show is the traffic being redirected uh, using fake BGP announcements. Um, I don't know if the URL is still valid, but there, uh, there was this uh, study that showed how one day um, traffic also amongst other prefixes, there was the one for the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment, the traffic was redirected for a few hours and uh, no one noticed on the day. It was, uh, I think someone noticed because they were looking into other BGP data. And basically, uh, someone redirected traffic via via Ukraine. Um, no one noticed. Things still worked. And as of today, we we would have a way to fix these incidents to uh, prevent all these uh, all these path redirection to happen. But uh, it's it would be by using a protocol called BGPSec. Um, which unfortunately is not implemented um, anywhere at the moment. So these are uh, incidents that can happen. And this, the uh, Internet Society did a uh, review in 2017. We have even newer ones, but imagine having 14,000 incidents in one year and having 10% of all the autonomous system networks that were affected. So uh, this is a... A big issue. Uh, and for this, uh, we have some measures. We have filters, we have RPKI, we have BGPSec, which I mentioned, we have um, uh, RPF, and we have manners who basically puts everything uh, <coughs> together from these. Now, how, how we apply filtering? Um, we have techniques for deciding which routes to allow inside our routing table and also what to announce to our neighbors. Um, it is important because it's your first line of defense and uh, you can control what you are announcing. You don't have, um, there's nothing you can do to control what the other networks announce to you, but then you can decide what to accept from them. And how can you do this? 
you have data sources. You have IRRs, the internet routing registries. You have uh, Bogons lists. So addresses that should not be uh, visible in the, uh, in the internet routing table. And then there's peering DB, which is also an additional database that can help in defining what you should accept. <clears throat> so how do you generate a prefix filter? You have objects in the databases, the internet routing registry. Um, there are basically uh, three types of objects. There are route and route six, these are two. One is for IPv4, the other one for IPv6. And then there, there are AS sets. AS sets are objects where I define who my customers are. So I um, can give you an idea now. Let me share my um, uh, terminal, new terminal, make it bigger. And then I'll share it with you. That's the one. So <clears throat> I query I query this with who is. And if I do query who is uh, minus R, I say query the ripe database, so one specific database. And then I do AS. This is my AS set. There is a joke on here on my person object, but let's not look at the person object. Okay, there's a joke on uh, my person object. Let's not look at that. Uh, here, what I have is an AS set object that says, <clears throat> under here, the two members are AS58280 and AS141384. So these are my two members of this AS set. What does this mean? This means that if I use a tool like BGPQ4 and I say AS Stuki, it will tell me which networks are part of my uh, of my AS set. Now, someone decided to play a trick on me. That is a colleague, uh, and this are all the route objects that uh, you should be filtering for. So, this is a prefix list that you could load into your router to. Uh, filter what we are announcing to you. Now, don't look at these slash 32s and slash 31s because this is a prefix from uh, um, the Internet Society uh, labs. And uh, that's a um, that's an experiment that my colleague has started doing, that a colleague of mine has started doing. Uh, but you see these slash 24s, these are the two networks we have for the ISOC labs uh, that we run to do our own testing. And these are the three networks that I run. Well, no, these, these two are the two networks that I run specifically in my uh, routing domain. If I do for IPv6, so I do BGPQ4 minus six, <coughs> you'll see that there is this slash 52, this slash 52, this slash 48, and then I have slash 29, a slash 32, and a slash 29. And these are the three different uh, networks I have. Um, three, well, these are two networks, but one has uh, is announced as a slash 29 and as a slash 32, and the other one just as a slash 29. So if you want to build a, a, um, a prefix list, if you want to build filtering for uh, my ASN, you can use this uh, AS set, which gives you me and my customers, because I provide uh, transit to the uh, ISO clubs. Um, Tom, do you have an AS set? Yes, I do indeed. It's AS dash wireless connect. Do you want me to type it in on the. This one? Yeah, that's it. And see that Tom has a slash 32. Slash 40, just more specific than another slash 29, another slash 29, and another slash 29. So these are all customers of yours, or or these are all aggregated slash 29s you have? They were, they're, um, they're all, basically, I took two, uh, one's a customer, and then two are for two networks that we operate. 
So that would be those, kind of... Sorry. Yes. Do those prefix lists have um, exact length match semantics or uh, or longer prefix? No, no. These are these are uh, specific. So if you want okay. if you want something more specific, you have to do it like this. So you have to create two. Okay. Okay. So each individual prefix uh, are not all prefixes under this prefix. No, these are no exactly. This is just the specific prefix uh, uh, specific announcement. So um, okay, let's that explains so there are want... more specifics in there. So I can do. I can show you how this is built. I can do. Um, Basically, this is an, what's called an inverse query. And I'm telling the database, give me all the entries in your database where the origin is AS58280. And what I get are root objects. And these are this slash 22, that's this one with uh, this specific origin, maintainer, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot more to know, but let's not focus on that. This slash 29, this slash 29. Now, you might have seen that when I run BGPQ4 for minus 6 IS2 key, you get also uh, this slash 32, which is not here. This is, I keep it there because this comes from another database. These entries are on the RIPE database, which is authoritative for uh, the networks we're talking about. And then there are other databases. One of them is called RADB, where um, you can create your own objects. You pay every year four or $500, and then you get a maintainer, and then you can create your objects. But the, the difference is that RADB doesn't have a way to figure out who is the holder of, a, of the address space that's trying to, where you're trying to create a root object. So if there is no other object already covering that address space, you can just create it. And that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> so if I query RADB, you'll see that there is this slash 32 object, uh, and there isn't the other slash 29 object, because this one was created by, by Vulture because I, I wanted to run BGP with them. They just created the entry in RADB for me. It's a proxy entry. And I could ask for it to be deleted, but I always use this as an example to show how data could be spread across different databases and how easy it is to create root objects in other databases. So Tom, you want to say something? Yeah, no, like uh, it's basically, uh, I suppose if you want to, if you want to, do, like uh, it's useful seeing the BGP4, BGP Q4 command, but uh, there's, what I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, I'm going to share the screen for a second, um, and I'll talk okay. about my favorite website in the whole world. Uh, hold on, I'm going to share. Is it Ripestat? Is it IRR Explorer? It's Ripestat. Uh, oh. It's just super awesome. Hold on. Am I, you're seeing my page there at the moment. Cool. We do. Cool. And uh, let's see what we'll do. We'll just go. So I'm going to talk about ripe.net first. If you ever like wanted to look up any, like pretty much any global resource, even the ones that Ripe aren't that responsible for, um, I, I do have to say that the right website is pretty useful. So, like for instance, AS62129, that'll be my autonomous system number. You do a search and you get details of, let's say, my IDET number or uh, number object. So, you can actually see what autonomous systems I'm actually. That's my RPSL, that's my root policy specification language. And so, you can say, oh, well, I'm going to import from Cogent and uh, Hurricane Electric accept any because I'm accepted uh, <laughs> their transit. And then obviously I'm accepted from Packet Clearing House here, anything that Packet Clearing House has announced. And then we have like obviously the AS112 and all that. So you have different ones that we pull in. Um, and then what we announce as well, like so we, we have some announcements there as well. And, like So import is what we're 
going to accept as root or BGP uh, prefix announcements from other people. And then the export is what we will intend to announce. So for the vast majority, it's we just announce our own prefix set, so our RAS, our RAS set. So what we're saying here is we will announce AS Wireless Connect and not default. But then there'll be some customers where we will say we actually announce us and uh, <coughs> we announce any plus default if a customer specifically requests a default route announcement. Now, <coughs> um, but then there's stats that right on this. Tom, is that do you, do you do you explicitly put the don't don't announce default so it's explicit or um or it's is just, that... that's just would be an exact like be honest most like if I was to look at this if I like if I go back to sorry right on that. If I look at mine, right, what most people look at here, if I look at AS62129, uh, so what they're looking there is, uh, okay, it's it's it, what what they're going to look at is, what am I accepting? What am I importing from? And then they'll look at, okay, well, let's look at AS Wireless Connect. So I'm just going to do that quickly here. So AS... What was that case? So it's, it was that. And you'll see that there's a couple of customers in here. So we've got my own AS and then some other uh, companies AS as well. So if I click on this one, we see what their root policy, and that's actually out of date. I have to get them to update that. So that should be actually announced. That's my old AS number. So what they need to say is, well, we will announce this AS as well. Uh, so that it's just... Uh, uh, but like in, in terms of um, if we go back, uh, if we also look at our root objects, let's say that we're announcing. So if we go, sorry, just to go. Uh, sorry, I'm driving wrong here at the moment. I've got this screen share thing in the middle of it. Okay, back. Except, okay, Jesus. And... If we go back to stat, I write stat there for a second. I'm going to go to the old UI for next for now. Uh, and then just put in uh, you may have heard of that prefix before. you get all sorts of information about their routing so you can see all the different objects and you see their bgb play which that's probably the coolest thing uh so you can see there's a number of updates for some reason then if we go to source data if we expand that one okay yeah this could be busy enough because so this actually shows all the different announcements and withdrawals over a period of time um, what I might do is show my own AS because I think it might be a little bit like that's just huge. But what's really nice is when you, uh, I'll just do it here. Sorry about this. Uh, where are we? Right. Sorry. Wrong one. What you can actually see is different AS changes, path changes. So when like certain things happen on the internet, you'll actually see the announcements. Uh, sorry about this. This is you'll actually. I'm just going to fast forward a bit, and you'll see when paths just change on the internet as providers lose links or go into maintenance. And obviously you'll see, like if I zoom in, that's my AS. And then you can see obviously Cogent is my transit provider, one of them. And then I go to see who else is. Uh, 
But so you can actually track what uh, withdrawals, what announcements, when did they occur? And it's a good way of tracing events that happened on the internet that if you want to actually try and understand why you did you get packet loss to a particular IP, you can actually see what the BGP announcements were at the time. Um, the, I'll just stop the share for now. Um, and I think we'll go back to the slides or do you want to do a further demo, Max? I think we can go back to the slides now because um, otherwise we don't, uh, don't manage to do everything. Well, uh, we're not, we're not definitely Max. Uh, Max. Uh, well, it, it's in packages uh, and, and on FreeBSD, it's in the packages. I guess it's in the OpenBSD packages as well. It is in the OpenBSD packages course, as well. Yeah. In ports, um, it's in brew as well. So I have it on my my laptop is uh, is running macOS, and I have it from brew. But uh, you find it everywhere. It's uh, and it's on on GitHub as well. And who maintains it, uh, Max? <laughs> uh, one of the usual suspects. <laughs> it's Yob. Yob. Uh, Yob. Yes, of course. It's uh, it's Yob. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so what, what are the principles? Are filter as close to the edge as possible, as precisely as possible. You can use root objects. Um, here we, we have highlighted two uh, different filtering techniques, uh, explicit permit or explicit deny. Um, I would uh, suggest using explicit permit everywhere. So just uh, uh, accepting what you should be accepting and not anything else. Um, but then important is to accept Bogon ASNs, uh, sorry, to not accept Bogons, uh, both in ASNs and prefixes. Do not accept your own prefix. Do not accept uh, the default route unless you requested it. Uh, nothing that's too specific. And when we say too specific, there is a rule of thumb on the internet. For IPv4 is, uh, anything that's more specific than a slash 24, so 25 on, uh, you should be filtering it out. And when it's uh, IPv6, at the moment, the limit is on the slash 48. I say at the moment because I believe uh, that one at one point it will be moved up to, say, a slash 32 or, uh, or 36. Because... Um, what I always like to, to use as an example is I have two slash 29s. Um, imagine if I were to de-aggregate all of them into slash 48s, I would have 1 million slash 48s. Um, if I were to try to announce 1 million slash 48s at the internet exchanges where I am peering, um, I would disrupt basically the whole internet for a whole day. And I see, Jan, you would like to say something. Shouldn't um, your BGP peering, especially route servers, have a maximum number of acceptable prefixes per BGP session and kick yeah. you out after 2 million I, or so? I can prepare that and uh, put it on, put on peering DB that I am announcing 2 million. And if I wait a couple of days when the uh the the, the 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 route server configuration has, has proceeded if i create all the route objects i need to create um there shouldn't be any problem uh on the filtering side to announce mm. uh all these people Max, might what? want to see the world burn next yeah, year yeah. You, you want to support slash 26 over uh, ip uh, before nice I'm just going to share my screen there. I just want to show in line with those ingress filters. Um, one of the cool things uh, we can share, uh, we can show you is in the examples, bhbd.com, um, there's a really nice uh, uh, set of default filters that are actually quite useful. And uh, a little trick for those of you who want to look these are best practice, uh, are pretty damn close to it. 
and you can actually use it to uh, build roots, uh, root policy, uh, filter policy for other uh, vendors is to actually take this and transpose its meaning to whatever vendor you're using. Um, so if I was to just uh, browse in here, sorry, I'm just going to have a look. So we got the bog on, you know, the, the, the broadcast announced the 240.0-4, the future use, um, uh, one that was always curious so, uh, for me. Um, and obviously, you know, you've got your documentation, your RFC 1918s, um, and then obviously you have some uh, V6 uh, prefixes that have special meanings. Um, but you also then start to see the difference. Uh, so whether you want to you want to comment if you want to accept default routes. So sometimes if you're uh, with a smaller upstream provider, or you just don't want to have to deal with a full routing table that you don't have diversity, you would typically uh, uh, you would uh, use uh, you would uncomment these, or else you'd be expanding the default free zone or the DFC or Z, which whatever way you pronounce it. Um, you have some nice, uh, what else there? Oh, um, do you have different? Uh, so we have a prefix set here. We can talk about that, but I'll just move on. But then you've got your standard lengths here. So technically they're saying from 16 to 48, which is what uh, um, Max was alluding to would be a million 48s, uh, slash 48s, which would be just, uh, you know, it would kill uh, the internet. So, and probably make him a very unhappy and unpopular man. So he, he won't do it because he's nice, you see. Um, and, uh, 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 but like you also see with the 8 slash 8 to 24, so there's no prefixes announced that are, are smaller than a slash or bigger than a slash 8. So there you're, and then obviously if you're a nice little graceful shutdown community, and set the local prep to zero. So that's a nice way of, you know, so you're actually saying, even if you're learning prefixes from that, you're now going to, uh, you're going to de-prefer them and you'll only use them as the last resort, effectively. Um, deny quick from set bogans, is there anything else? Oh yes, you've got the dodgy uh, AS23456 and the other reserved AS, uh, the private AS is, and is there an, oh tonight from max as length 100 um i remember asking this on the the miscellaneous back in the day and the lads were saying well there's no need for it and i was like well you could happen that you can have very long as paths so why don't we just filter it if they're rare or not really used um so i'm glad to see that that has has made its way in um you know it was it, it you know so um max is there anything you'd like to add to that or, or is there anything i missed that you'd say tom go back up and show um not that i can think of right now i just wanted to show the our i our numbers our our my networks i think it's up here so prefix set my numbers network so you can just simply group up all your announcements, all your intended announcements in here, and then you've just one rule allowing it. Because before Claudio Yecker and Job did their fantastic work on revamping open uh, BGBD from uh, I think it was six or three onwards, um, you know, with with the help of Ripe uh, and other sources of funding, uh, they revamped it so that because my older rule sets. For every prefix, you needed a line of, of code. And by actually just having those prefix sets, it actually made the uh, configuration length of my files a lot shorter because, because obviously for every transit provider, I'd have, oh, allow this prefix, allow this prefix. Now I can just say, allow my networks, allow my customer networks. Yep. Didn't they also add another optimization where... For each predicate, it calculated if, if this doesn't match, this is the next line which could potentially match. So if you had 10 lines matching against the same RS yeah. number, if this doesn't match, you can skip 10 the other yeah. nine rules, which they also it, helps a lot. 
I remember Claudia t- talking about it on the MIS uh, or in tech. It was the skip steps. And it was an optimization that they made in the, uh, it was an optimization that they made in the, um, <coughs> uh, in the actual PF before. And then they basically just transposed our, I'm not, I'm not saying it was a simple transposition, but they used the same principle and applied it to the, the BGP scale. But you're like you're talking about convergence times going. I think from if I recall correctly, Max, you correct me if I'm wrong. I think they were saying from 30 minutes of a convergence time with like you know hundreds of thousands of lines of code of, of actual configuration filters. Uh, down to a couple of hundred and, you know, it was 30 seconds. So, you know, it was significantly faster, um, you know, uh, orders of magnitude. Heard worst case numbers of up to two hours. Uh, Mo is saying I have to do an interview with Claudio someday. Uh, Hopefully, yes. So, Claudio, if you're listening, uh, and job, love to do an interview with you. Uh, and uh, I consider it like a free training session for me. I won't sell it to them like that. I'll be like, look, we get your message out. That's the way I'm going to put it. But uh, absolutely, I'd love to have them. Um, uh, so, um, uh, sorry, we'll go back to the slides now that uh, I've pulled, but just that examples. So in OpenBSD, and I'm sure it's similar in FreeBSD, the ETC examples, and of course the manuals, but the ETC examples, the guys have put a bit of effort, or the people, all of the people have put a bit of effort into. Uh, apologies for the use of the word guys. It's just that in Ireland, it's it's actually gender neutral. It's just to be, <laughs> it, it is culturally, it's gender neutral. Uh, lads and guys, are, it's it's everyone. But uh, but uh, it was it, it is intended to be gender neutral on that one. So, uh, but the people have put a lot of effort into that, uh, and that's it's important, you know. So over to was, you, Max. Uh... De- no, Deb, Deb Drup, uh with a question, but we can't hear you when you're talking, I see. So if you want, uh, what did Deb Rupp, did he write it on the? Yes. I didn't see At least e- Even when you're not muted, we can't hear you. So there's something going on with your, uh, and I see Jason open his microphone. Yeah, just a just a quick one, Max. Um, on sure. um, what's RIPES and APNIC's take on um, uh, redu- reducing the from a forty eight to a thirty two? Because we were only issued a forty eight from APNIC, so we're going to have a heap of issues if they go yes. and change it around. No, in in your case, I guess that's what you call a PI. It's uh, um, sure. so there are that that's taken from a specific part of the address space. So if uh, <clears throat> if you if we were to collectively say, well, let's not accept all the slash 48s, but let's do there's a part of the address space where the uh, it's called PA, at least in Ripeland, it's um, it's a it's called provider aggregatable, which is a word that uh, Tom as a as a native speaker you might tell me doesn't exist in reality but um it's called provider aggregatable and uh means that it's address space that i can sub assign well assign to my customers mm-hmm. and then in uh, again in ripe there are there's part of the address space that's called provider independent and the difference is provider aggregatable you would get a slash 32 up to slash 29 and when provider independent, you usually get a slash 48. In some cases, if you can really justify it, you get a 47. If you can really stretch it, you might get a 44 or a slash 40. Um, <clears throat> um, one second. And uh, um, I guess in that case, there would be filters that adapt. So they say, Give me only slash 32s from this part of the address space where I get all the provider aggregatable and give me up to slash 48 in that uh, area of the address space. Um, um, if I may share... It would be relatively easy to, to build it. Because we, this, share... is, this is all data we know from the uh, regional registries. If I may share this, there's actually a very good example of this, which is uh, up here. There was a section that... Um, 
there was a section that they were basically allowing for smaller announcements or longer announcements than slash 24s. It was a trial that uh, I think uh, Aaron were doing. And so you'd have to accept from those prefixes. Uh, you'd have to accept longer than slash 24. It was an experiment. Uh, it was actually in an older version of this file and must be must have been changed. But you actually see it here, um, the various different ranges. I'm just trying to see where is it. 203 slash 24 or no, no, it was. I'll take it out, but uh, sorry, I'm going to stop the share. Uh, it was on an older, it was literally an iron. It was like a slash that you would allow up to, I think, a slash 27. And it was, it was, it was a like a for small organizations that they, but it was it was years ago when I saw it. Sorry, it might be uh, it might be obsolete at this stage. Um, Deborah yeah. just asked, uh, is there a max distance from who you would accept announcements from? Uh, and I think that might have been just what I touched on. Okay, so the pre the the communities that you get from uh, you could you could set things with the BHP communities like who you announce to and who the other person might announce. So you could say, don't announce my prefix. So for instance, in a DDoS situation, for argument's sake, if you were really screwed, if you were really getting hammered and you wanted to stop, one way of doing this is stop announcing on transit. It's your announcing your prefix brings in the traffic, okay? So you, you drop tra transit and you hope that you can keep enough business going on your IXs, okay? It's not great but needs most. Um, and so by not announcing, but what you can actually do is, let's say there's a specific AS like Max. Max and me have a falling out over the way Tom keeps interrupting him during the training. And so he decides to DDoS me. And so then I say to Hurricane Electric, would you ever stop announcing my prefixes to that lad, please? So you can do certain things like that where you can, uh, depending on whether your provider implements that feature, but you can sometimes say, uh, why your pre your AS number uh, zero, their AS number, or something like that. So there is uh, there is different ones, but it depends on your upstream provider. Um, and uh, you can also do things like ask them to set local preferences. So you can say, hey, I want you to set a local preference. You could actually set, you can manipulate their local preference to override whatever they had. With a uh, with a community string when you're advertising, and they'll they'll overwrite the road, uh, and so you have to kind of you know look at those. And typically, the bigger the ISP, the more refined and more granular you will see those. But but in terms of not accepted distances, um, you know, in terms of internet censorship, I'm not really for any of that. But what I, I'll just say that. It's usually in those types of distance things, what you're trying to do is announce on an IX to keep your commerce going and keep as many people connected to you as possible um, while you're enduring an attack. And uh, that's really, that's realistically, because while it's easy to drop the gamers off for half an hour when they're being, you know, being boosted, inverted commas, um, it's slightly more challenging when it's a website. Uh, because now when you black hole that upstream, we might, I know that uh, Max will get to that later, but you're completing the actual denial of service at that stage. You're basically taking it. What you're doing is uh, to quote the Bible, it's better for one to die for the people. But you you know, if you're getting about a hundred gig of it down on a 10 gig pipe, what you need to do is get that hundred gig off that 10 gig pipe. So everyone else who uses that 10 gig can use it and that's where you use the remote trigger black hole to say look stop because no one's going to get into it if you're trying to put a hundred gig down a 10 gig pipe uh so i i'll hand back to my good friend and colleague max um, hope that answers we, your question deb we have a question on the chat and then jan also has a hand up so the question on the chat for the moment is how much backlash do you expect from providers um whose address plan wasn't designed around the lowered prefix length. Um, that I don't know. Um, 
what I'm saying is just just a personal uh, belief or idea um, that I've had for a, for a little while about um, the fact that we might at one point move the needle bit from slash forty eight to something um, uh, bigger. Uh, bigger in terms of uh, prefix uh, prefix size because the and the reason I say this is because. As I as I explained, I could just by myself um, create a large um, issue to the whole internet by announcing my deaggregated slash forty eights. If you if you imagine uh, a series of different ISPs, each one announcing even a small subset of these slash forty eights, let's say a hundred thousand each. Uh, you need just 10 ISPs in the world to match in IPv6 what we have now in IPv4 in terms of size of routing table. Um, and that wouldn't take much. Like someone with just <clears throat> a little bit of address space could just do this. And that's, that's where my uh, suggestion comes. But this is not something that has been discussed too much in, in different forums. And... Uh, well, 10 stupid ISPs. There might be reasons. Um, like hijacks. Uh, or hijacks even, yes. Um, if you do a hijack, your response is to DM. Like if someone announces, let's say, two of your, let's say, slash 29, uh, and they announce two slash uh, 30s, let's say, then your thing is, well, I need to announce four slash 31s. I hope I'm right on that. <laughs> Sorry, and, it's and, heavy. <laughs> and even the suggestion here, like limit, maybe limit the number of prefixes per ASN. How can you do that? Like, how can you tell me I don't have, let's say, a hundred thousand uh, pops all over the world? I could have them, and I want to announce a, a, a slash a forty-eight for each one of these uh, sites, pops, or anything. So, um, but it, it becomes tricky very quickly. So Jason asked a really good question there about the, his PI space. Now, my understanding is in PA space, right? When you ask for a slash 29, they give you a slash 29, but they reserve up. So if you need more than the slash 29, they will just say, oh, by the way, that's now a slash 28. Um, you have, you have how much. Three, three bits of reserved address space. That's undocumented. That's... Uh, Sorry. It, it doesn't exist, but it's there. Um, so it means uh, that, but it keeps the routing table manageable for future growth of any organization. Supposedly, yes. Yeah. So the idea also is fragments. instead of instead of getting a yeah well instead of getting a, a new prefix, uh, they are just going to give you to 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 tell you you can enlarge your prefix size, which sounds more like a spam email, but. Um, <laughs> can, uh, but, but um, does but that yeah. happen on, on PI space as well? That I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, no. Someone's going to have to stop the Zoom. Yes, I I, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll try to post the slides there. If not, I will make them available also on my uh, my own uh, page. And uh, I heard and stop was... Zoom mentioned. You guys can go as long as you want. You know. Yeah, we know, we know. But someone has to leave, so that's why we were. Oh no! Just someone was just saying that. I was just reading it out. Uh, there was another. There was another point that yeah. So. It may not be stupid. I suppose the point I was trying to make, Jan, there, and me and Max were, is sometimes people will deaggregate in reaction to a situation. Uh, of course, and it's legitimate. in doing so to such a ridiculous degree, we're imposing a cost on everyone else mm -hmm. on the internet. Why I recommended they should be forced to document a billing address as part of the route objects so that everyone can order TCAM space on their bill. <laughs> It's an interesting proposition. Uh, uh, I think uh, I I am sure the uh, address policy only... working group, the address policy working group, will be happy to get your proposal. <laughs> so <laughs> just kidding, because there is no single proposal to account for every possible situation. No, not true. Okay, 
Let's go back to the slides. Sorry, yes. I got to. I got to. I'll be pushing out a bit. Sorry about no, that. No, no, no problem. No problem. Let's go back to the slides. Um, well, we were sorry. I went ahead to checking how much time we had. Um, um, here we go. So um, don't accept if the AS path is too long. And you can see that um, in this case, um, Tom has um, a configuration there that, that showed you uh, more than 100 should not be present in the routing table. And then create filters based on the uh, internet routing registries. So what we showed. Um, so what are bogons? Bogons are routes you shouldn't see in the routing table. So uh, address space that's private, that's reserved, and so on. Um, the uh, Tim Camry actually provides a very nice uh, reference for it. Um, and it's uh, you can get it as a file. Um, so every day they publish a new file because not only it contains the reserved space, but also the non-allocated space, non-assigned, non-allocated. So you basically get a list of all the address space that you should not be seeing at all, and you can filter based on that. I usually spend some time uh, showing the, 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 the file and everything, but we don't have time tonight. Then there are ASN bogons that I've already mentioned, the uh, transition ASN, the reserved address um, uh, ASNs for private use and so on. And then you have uh, prefix lists. I mentioned BGPQ4, which is the successor to BGPQ3. There would be the level three filter generator, but I tried it earlier today and it's broken. Uh, so I'm not gonna show it. And there's a software called P, uh, P eval, uh, prefix evaluation, and it does basically the same uh, uh, same that BGPQ4 does. So I would recommend at this point you just uh, take BGPQ4. Um, you can create uh, prefix lists for BIRD, for OpenBGPD, for um, uh, Microtik, for uh, Juniper, any vendor. BGPQ4 creates everything. Even you could create, you could um, set it up to generate uh, entries for um, PF or IPFW. So it's really flexible as a tool. Then <coughs> here we go. Longest accepted prefixes, slash 24 for IPv4 and slash 48 for IPv6. Um, keep in mind, uh, IPv4 address space exhaustion is not a good reason to weaken your to weaken your fil filters. So don't accept slash 25s or 26th. That those are not supposed to be there at all. You can filter by AS path. Um, it's uh, scalable, but um, for example, nowadays, it, it was more used in the past where uh, building large prefix lists wouldn't fit into the, um, the router's configuration space, the NVRAM. But nowadays, um, prefix lists work much, much better than, than playing with AS paths. And um, then for routing security, we have reverse path forwarding. Uh, uh, unicast uh, called URPF. Uh, you have two main modes. There's uh, uh, two more modes, actually. There's a loose, strict, uh, there is a VRF, and um, there's another one. But um, basically, uh, RPF is a system where when you accept a packet, the router checks if the entry is in the routing table. So you received it from a network that is in your routing table. And when you're looking at strict mode, um, the route for that entry should point to the same interface on which you received the, the packet. Uh, otherwise the packet just gets discarded. And then in loose mode, uh, you just check that the entry exists in the routing table. Now, why is, uh, so where and, do we use RPF? Yes. And including the, uh, would I be right in saying that the loose also includes the default route as well in that? Um, Fortunately, and... yes. But yeah, w w one second, one second. So we have um, strict mode that you should be using uh, pointing to your customers. So when, when you're an, IS, an access ISP, you have your say uh, core router, 
uh, uh, interface or interfaces that go towards your aggregation routers, uh, that's where you should be enabling strict RPF. And uh, um, um, uh, towards the rest of the internet, you could set up loose RPF. But normally, I would be against that. I would suggest just doing strict RPF towards your customers. Um, mm. Now, what, what happens though, Max, when you have customer with two transit ISPs? So, yeah. like, if you put strict onto them and they'll drop their session to you, then you're black hole. And if you do, if you do strict towards your transits, you're doing it wrong. Because uh, then it means you you don't allow for asymmetric routing. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, for while your customer. If you do, yeah, but if you do lose uh, RPF, then you're not checking enough. So my suggestion is just do strict towards your customers, and that's it. And um, so the problem, uh, I see Jan has a hand up, and is it related to the question in the chat? Yes. Uh, Yes. Well, ECMP also uh, has issues with uh, with RPF. Basically, if 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 you've multiple paths to the customer, or if the like so, if, the, if you're the transit for the customer, and they have another connection, it, there is it's feasible that you could get, receive traffic from the customer, but also that you could receive it from another path like through another transit provider for the customer. Um, having strict modes facing the customer, uh, I'm wondering what does that do with the traffic that would have come in from another direction? Uh, you know, because sometimes you can't select an interface. Strict is, um, here's be dragons uh, let, let, let me put it that way. They, they're, and implementations vary. I, I would have more faith in the software implementations than some of the hardware implementations, I think. Um, the loose one the loose one has another really good advantage that when you start doing black hole routes, it actually drops on ingress as well. So, so loose has the functionality. So if you do black hole routing, you're, you're only really discarding traffic towards that person really. But when you turn on URPF with black hole routing, now you're going to that router will discard packets from that source as well. So there's a there's a, uh, a nice kind of uh, feature there. That said, I have tried turning it on in certain situations, and I have profoundly regretted it, and just gone back to using um, ACLs on the actual peering and uplinks on that side. It's just. It depends, but like I would be have confidence in free BSDs, net BSDs, drive BSDs implementation. Not an issue there. Uh, it's it's when they've optimizations done uh, on on hardware platforms that you you need to be more concerned. So that's that you you went to the point that I was going to suggest for multi path routing. That is instead of doing RPF, do uh, ACLs, and they would apply much better. <clears throat> so yeah. So to answer you, uh, Jan. Yeah. <clears throat> then, if you put all this together, you get a BCP thirty-eight, best secure and practice thirty-eight. Uh, yeah. Don't mix them and use ACLs exactly. Um, BCP thirty-eight is the basis for having cleaner uh, routing and a cleaner routing table. And. Uh, um, this means uh, setting up prefix filters, setting up bogon filters, and um, uh, RPF. It's documented as BCP38 at the ITF, and this together goes to become part of uh, MANNERS, the mutually agreed norms for routing security, and uh, which is something which is a project from uh, Internet Society to help the global community in getting better. Um, Bet, uh, better routing, cleaner routing. So with this, we finished the part about BGP and there is RPKI. I can do, I can take 10, 15 minutes to do an introduction to RPKI if everyone is okay with it. Um, yes, yes, Tom. That would sound good. What I wanted to do briefly, if, if I may, uh, was I, I wanted to kind of show the guys, just uh, show everyone, um, 
just just an example of an ACL list that you might see. Uh, and what, so this is uh, I'm now trying to prove my manners uh, application. So uh, so look so basically. Um, like manners, if you look at the, you know, uh, manners.org, uh, they kind of ask you a few questions and some of the steps that you take, BCP38. So just as an alternative to, uh, to spare me one second, as an alternative, what you can do is uh, you can implement these. So you'll see here, and I'm sorry about the writing size. I don't know if I could change the font so handy. If I can, I will. Full screen, maybe. You could yeah. drop the resolution. Oh, that's just too much hassle. Uh, hold on. And I, I like you, but I don't like you that much. You know, that kind of way. It's kind of... Uh, uh, hold on it's a okay. second. Uh, hang on a second. I'll... Uh, it, it, can you see it? Or is there any hope of you seeing that at the moment? It is a bit too small. Even if I have a oh, large my 4K screen, display, it displays just fine, but not everyone. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just open a, a separate putty session. Uh, <laughs> and meanwhile, he's got, uh, uh, and uh, I, I'll open a, a putty session with a custom uh, font. So just you work away in the background. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, Max, do you want to continue with your RPKI, and I'll I'll get this up on a separate, and we can just shoot back. Sure. sure. Okay. Sorry and for then, holding. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Now, where did my slides go? Uh, here. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> we have looked at routing on the internet. We have BGP announcements. Uh, we use a protocol. Uh, to say uh, I have a network and to receive announcements that say I have this other network. But then we need to trust the data we receive, or we need to find a way to figure out um, if this data can be trusted. So we use the Internet Routing Registry, which in most cases it can be the RIPE database. There's the ARIN uh, Routing Registry. There's the... Uh, Afrenic routing registry and so on. Um, and this gives us a certain confidence that the data we see in BGP is truthful. But uh, some of this IRR data cannot be trusted um, because of the lack of accuracy, the data is incomplete, there's no maintenance. I've, uh, I was building a tool together with another colleague and um, we, we needed to figure out a small country with a relatively uh, small number of prefixes. And we picked a country in, in Africa um, because that's where my colleague actually lives. And uh, we spent the whole day debugging the tool, which seemed not to work, authenticating route objects. And then we discovered that none of the routes in the country was registered in any uh, routing registry. Um, so there are countries that are like this. And then I mentioned it already, that there's there are uh, databases, um, RADB, AltDB, where there is no verification of who holds the IP addresses or the autonomous system numbers. So for this uh, reason, um, there is uh, RPKI, the Resource Public Infrastructure, um, where it ties IP addresses and ASNs to public keys. Um, <clears throat> as an addition, it follows the hierarchy of the registries and it's uh, data you can trust, actually. That's what should be written there. Um, so basically we have the same data we have in route objects, but with a hierarchy that follows the registries and with a um, uh, chain of trust that we can verify, follow, and uh, with signatures we can check. So this is data we can trust. So as a short history, um, RPKI started in 2008. Um, uh, it, 
was defined at the ITF and we add uh, crypto security to IP addresses and autonomous systems and we, it provides data you can trust. So we start with the uh, all the registries that have a um, signature, uh, sorry, a, a CA in a, in a, um, and they have a, a certificate that covers all the uh, address space, zero slash zero. Uh, initially, it wasn't like this. Initially, um, the registries had um, specific networks signed because they had uh, <coughs> the specific uh, allocations made to them. But then uh, it was decided at one point that because networks can be transferred between certain registries and the others, so you can actually transfer a network between APNIC and uh, RIPE and RIPE and ARIN and ARIN and APNIC. Um, so it was decided to have the uh, registries sign zero slash zero. And then there is a, oops, there is a, um, for every LIR, for every uh, local registry, for every member of, in this case, RIPE, but it, it's the same for uh, ARIN, APNIC, uh, AFRINIC and uh, LACNIC. There is a um, CA that's created and it's signed with the, uh, that's then signed with the, by the uh, re uh, regional registry so that there is a chain of trust between the two. At this point, we have a new um, object that's called the ROA. And this becomes the center of everything RPKI. Um, for this, we have two parts though. One is the signature, so signing some data, and then there is the validating of the validation of this data. So these two parts are totally separate. So you could create your ROAs, sign them, do the signing, do the whole dance, that's called, but then not, not do any validation. So not verify what the others are doing or the opposite, you could validate what uh, the others are publishing without having created your own ROAs. Uh, as they are two separate processes, you could do however you want. But for the moment, we'll focus on uh, the signature part. So what is a ROA? It's a authorized statement from a resource folder. Um, it's basically a file <clears throat> that contains um, three pieces of information amongst others. Um, there's a lot more, but um, wait, ROA, what is in there? There's the prefix, so the network that, uh, for which you're creating the ROA, there is the origin ASN. <coughs> and then last, uh, there's an additional piece of information that's called the max length. The max length uh, helps me say, oh, I'm creating a ROA for this, uh, say, slash 16, but I want to I want this ROA to cover everything in this slash 16 up to a slash 24. So everything in between would be valid. Now, going back a couple of uh, slides, um, LIRs create ROAs for the resources. You can have multiple ROAs for the same prefix with different origin, different max length, and they can overlap as much as, they, as much as you want. So you can create them the way you want. And when you create a ROA, you're making a statement. You're saying, this is what you should see in the routing table. You should see this prefix originated by this autonomous system. So this autonomous system should be the one all the way to the right in the AS path. Now, how does, how does this work? Assuming we have a max length of 24, <coughs> oh, there was a prefix. So imagine you have a, a prefix that's a slash 22 um, um, up and max length says up to slash 24. So the slash 22 would be valid and the slash 23s would be valid. Wait a minute. That's not correct. Uh, hold on. Oh, well, that's correct. No, I oh, know. Yes, yes, yes. This perfect. and then that's yes, the yes. right is basically. Yes, yes, yes. Well. I got, I got a bit confused. So, 
uh, everything between slash 22 and slash 24 would be perfectly fine. Slash 25s, besides the fact that they would be filtered anyways, they would not be accepted. Now imagine this situation where we have this ROA, that's a slash 21 with max length slash 21. And this is the ASN that's supposed to originate this prefix. This means that slash 21 would be okay, but all the rest more specific would not be okay. Now, what if we want to announce something more specific? What we could do is go in and create another more specific row. In this case, slash 23, max length 24. So this means that this row would make these three BGP announcements valid. I could do the same on the other part of the address space, <coughs> slash 23 up to slash 23. That would only make this one valid and the rest would not be valid if, if seen on the routing table. That's now, uh, sorry? That's excellent. No, it's great. Yeah. Now, um, how should we use this? Max length is a powerful tool, but it exposes you to a series of uh, different issues. Imagine you have similar to the case I showed you before, uh, slash 22, max length slash 24. What happens is assuming you are announcing, let's say you're uh, slash 23 out of this, <coughs> what I could do as an attacker, it could be, let's say I operate a data center. Inside my data center, I could set up a tiny little router in a corner, connect that to my core router and use that small router to originate a slash 24 out of your address space. I could go into my uh, AS set, add your ASN into my AS set, wait a couple of days for everyone to update their, their prefix lists and all the configurations. And then I would start announcing this slash 24. The slash 24 would start attracting traffic out of your address space. The problem is uh, it would be fully, fully valid from a, an RPKI perspective because it's being originated by the same ASN that's in the row. There you go, that would be valid. So how do you fix this? One recommendation is to make um, basically ROA for your BGP announcements only. So this max length up to slash 23. So that would just cover what you're announcing and not more. This would be considered invalid. The other way would be to uh, just announce the, all the prefixes yourself, but this way you would just be polluting the, uh, the routing table all the time. So max length is powerful because it allows you to, to create a, a statement and then uh, apply the statement to a larger set of, uh, of your address space, but at the same time, it opens uh, uh, possibilities for attackers. There is, a, there is a draft RFC that shows this kind of uh, issues and a couple of others. So the ROA is a piece of data uh, encoded in uh, bear, uh, with bare encoding, ASM1, and um, it becomes part of the chain of trust. So <clears throat> the ROA gets signed by the uh, local CA from the LIR, which in turn gets signed by all the, by the, uh, the top um, uh, CA uh, certificate from the uh, regional registry. So by following the, the chain of trust, you can validate that the, uh, the ROA is okay. And then you can assume that the content of the ROA can be trusted. So um, the certificate hierarchy follows the allocation hierarchy. This is the additional part where you have the five registries and their members, which then get, sort of get ROAs. So you have this, um, uh, this structure that allows you to figure out who to trust, how, how, what level of trust you can put in there and it gives the uh, data contained in the ROAs 
Well, it gives you more confidence. You can trust the data contained in the ROAS. Now, you can do two parts of uh, two types of uh, RPKI. One is the hosted RPKI, where the regional registries hosts the CA and signs all your ROAS. Uh, there's automated signing and uh, key rollovers. Um, so you just have to go in, create your ROAS, and you're done. Or you can do delegated RPKI. Uh, where you run your own CA software. There are two implementations at the moment, but one, the first one listed there by Dragon Research Labs called uh, the RPKI Toolkit or RPKI.net, which is um, very outdated. It still runs on Python 2, and uh, there is no rewrite um, in foreseen. While Krill from NLNet Labs is written in uh, Rust, and it's the most recent implementation that uh, that follows all the recent uh, standards. What you need to do is you basically set up a connection with the CA from the RIR, you generate your uh, certificate, and then you get, get it signed by the parent CA. Now, when you do a delegated RPKI, you have an, an additional issue. Is everything okay, Max? Max is frozen. Yes, yes. I got I got frozen for a moment. Yes. Sorry. Yes, okay. yes. I'm I should be back now. And um, so I was saying when you when you run delegated RPKI, you have an additional issue that is where do you publish then your ROAS? And uh, so you need a publishing point that is basically an HTTP uh, server. Um, the problem that people are now showing, that people are now telling everyone uh, is out there, is that as we grow the number of people who run delegated RPKI, the number of different endpoints that every validator, and we'll see what a validator is in a moment, the number of endpoints they have to contact, they have to get in touch with, will, uh, will, will grow. And so RPKI will reach a point where it will not scale anymore. So... Um, the suggestion now is to, if you want to run delegated RPKI, run it, but then as a publishing point, use your regional registry. So there's one endpoint that gets contacted. Uh, um, you can also certify PI resources. Um, <clears throat> there's a specific wizard at, uh, at RIPE. Why, why is this important? It's because normally uh, PI users, pr uh, provider independent address space users, don't have a direct relationship with the RIPE and CC. So they normally don't have access on the LIR portal to change their, th uh, their, their data. But for RPKI, an exception was made. So uh, this can be done. Now, you have to have a maintainer on the organization yeah. object. So it's not just enough to have it on the root object. I had to do this uh, a couple of weeks ago where <laughs> and so you, you have to be the maintainer for the organization object um not just the root objects and the the uh, the autumn um max what am i might or if you don't mind what i'll do is just give you a break for a second because you've been talking for a bit i'm just going to show the uh the bcp38 just to break it up for a second if that's okay with you Sure. So, okay. Let me stop my screen sharing then. Go um, ahead. Here we go. So hopefully this will be a bit better than what it was before. So does everyone see that now? So literally just for this one, we've got IP access list, external anti-spoof outbound. So literally what I'm saying. So I have a couple of what I would call your, your kind of standard bogons that you'd all know, carrier grade NAT. RC 1918, the IPv4 autoconf, some documentation networks. Um, and then we've got like the likes of uh, the obviously multicast, IP multicast, and the future use uh, documented set, which will probably be to at some stage prolong IPv4 a bit longer. Um, I'm controversial, I know, but there you go. Um, and then you've got, let's say, obviously permitting all of our IP space and our customer IP space. 
um, and specific hosts that we have on our network. And then basically we deny everything outbound after that. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty specific. Um, and that's literally applied to any switch port that is, um, that, that's, let's say, facing upstream providers or peering providers. And so I'm just gonna show the inbound rule is slightly different. So here we're basically blocking all known um, uh, bogons. And then basically we're denying anything uh, from our from our uh, IP ranges altogether and any specific host. So this is kind of unusual, but it's to stop anything just uh, uh, that might be specifically purporting to be an interface on our, our router as well. So there's actually including peering lands and uh, and stuff like that. So that was just to, to show you that. Um, is there any other rules that I want to show? Sorry, I'll just double check. But that that's a simple way. Uh, that's that if you're afraid to implement URPS, and trust me when I say this, that that mightn't be the most irrational thing that you're afraid of. Uh, you know, like. It, if you have your own test lab, if you have custom ASIC, or not when I say custom, I mean standard routers that have ASICs and acceleration, uh, turn the feature on in the lab if you have it, um, or late at night, but uh, it, 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 it... I'd like to use URPF more than I'm able to at the moment. That's the way I put it. I think it's the best way I put it. Um, and Max is back in. So those filters... Yes. Those filters, um, were they on your ASIC um, switches? Uh, not nothing to do with your um, RRs? Yes. So those, uh, it, I did that deliberately because uh, to optimize the TCAP space. So, uh, like we we use switches between our routers and our upstreams, uh, primarily for flexibility to, to fail over between the two routers. Uh, on each on each peering point or in each um, uh, transit location, so um, so from that point of view, it was it was ideal. So th the reason why I'm saying this, sorry, and it's a good question, Jason. For everyone else, you'll have a limited TCAM, as Max was saying, it's the expensive memory, and when you optimize your routers, like we're using the uh, RISTA 7050s. Uh, uh, um, and you can optimize them for routing or switching. Um, but I do believe that also affects the ingress filtering because um, that just occupies uh, space on the TCAM, uh, on the ASIC as well. So, so we actually, so it's just, it's more efficient to do it there. The switches are doing less. They don't have much filtering to do. They're not learning as many prefixes or MAC addresses typically. So it just makes sense to do it there. So I did it actually, and I literally apply it onto the ports just facing the transit. So nowhere else, um, not not trying to, uh, not trying to and, and it works pretty well as well. So, uh, so does that answer your question, Jason? Does anyone else have any questions on the BCP38 just specifically? There's one um, in the chat, yeah. Yes. Um, what so? What's keeping you is that you can't fit the whole uh, ACL, which would be derived from the uh, uh, reverse path filtering. What's keeping you from enabling URPF? So, uh, so when I turned on URPF, um, I didn't get much time to diagnose this, but I, I got a. I said it should be like a non-event. Uh, and when I did, I, I lost uh, a significant portion of communications. Uh, and mm. because, unfortunately, I did it in a window where I said this is going to be a non-event, everything should be just as normal. And unfortunately, what I got was a massive notch in the traffic. And I said, right, just back it out. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to come back again on this one. Um, but looking at the documentation, uh, it may be a version, it may be a bug on my, the, the cut of, uh, EOS that I'm running on the Aristas. Um, but and it, it could also be my understanding of it. Like if, if, if some don't include the default route 
as the uh, as your as a valid route to learn from. And if you are doing route summarization like I am, uh, you know, as these most, uh, you you need to rely on the default route. So so URPF is that's if it's blocking traffic, like the whole idea is just keep traffic moving. Um, where it's feasible to run URPF is when you have a device that's not interfacing with uh, systems controlled by other people. So when you know the traffic, so for instance, URPF on the BNG or the, you know, the, the gateway facing your customers, that's possible. IP source guard is another one. Um, you know, using DHCP option 82, you know, where you actually take the, you can actually learn which ports uh, switches are on and you actually have some DHCP snooping uh, so you can do IP source guard, I think they call it, on some of the switches, if it's IP over Ethernet. Um, it works fine. URPF would work well on a PPPoE concentrator because they're all slash 32s to your customers. Um, uh, it's just in, in, and in those situations, it would work. But just on my edge routers, it was problematic. And partially, I think it's because I have I have connected routes, so I'm using, um, uh, it's basically where you have uh, multiple IPs on a VRRP interface. Um, and so you can't obviously have multiple IPs on the physical interfaces. So you just dump in a connected route and say that range is reachable via that interface. It's, it's kind of a slightly unusual. So there's just a few edge cases there that it just picked up. But I suppose the way I, the why I wouldn't ask people not to, you should try implementing it, but beware of the notch. And if it does, then maybe roll back and try analyze it further. Uh, having detail about the URPF implementation. So I can say you'd have a high degree of confidence on BSD and software-based URPF implementations. There's no real um, crazy hardware-based optimization or shortcuts. And uh, you can certainly do it on PPPoE concentrators. Um, and you can supplement, you can get URPF type functionality as well from switches either through ACLs or automated with uh, DHCP option, uh, option A, uh, I think it's 82, and uh, IP source card. Um, you know, you often, you may see it from your providers already where they will only give you, you'll only be able to connect even if you control the layer two path, that unless it's a DHCP requested address, a granted address, it, uh, you won't get connectivity because they're, they're actually operating uh, an IP source card type uh, scenario, which makes sense, you know. Um, so, uh, does that answer everyone's questions related to URPF there? I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Uh, Max, I'm just thinking, would it be yeah. okay to pause for five minutes for a cup of tea? But we need, I think I need 10 minutes to finish. So okay. we finish no for 10. Um, we, okay. So uh, we've seen the signing part. Uh, you create your ROAS. You publish some information. Now there's the part where we look at how we validate that. And for, <coughs> for this, we have uh, validators, which is software that creates a local validated cache with all the valid rows. And uh, it does so by downloading the uh, repositories from the RIRs, uh, verifying the chain of trust, and, uh, and then talking to the routers using a specific protocol, that, a specific protocol that's called uh, RPKI RTR. So the way it works is uh, there's a software gets, it has um, uh, five, well, actually four files that are the trust anchor locator, the tiles. Four because uh, Aaron doesn't really, well, it does publish them, but before you can use it, before you can use the tile from Aaron, you have to acknowledge uh, terms and conditions. Um, so it used to be that you had to manually go and download the the Arin tal, but now it's uh, distributed with validators. It's just that the first time you run them, you have to explicitly 
uh, say you accept the terms and conditions set by uh, Aaron. Otherwise, no, uh, no American, no North American ROAS for you. Uh, the validator downloads uh, all this data, so the ROAS, the certificates, uh, and everything, and uh, verifies that uh, the chains of trust uh, work, and then distributes this data to the routers behind it. So with the ROAS on one side, which are now called uh, VRPs, uh, Validated Router uh, um, Routing Payload or something, and uh, BGP announcements, you mix them, into the router and then it helps uh, you making uh, better routing decisions. What are these better routing decisions? Bas basically they are uh, routing decisions made with additional data. We'll see that in a moment. Because before that we have the different validator options. We have Routinator, Rust, uh, we have our PKI client um, that's part of OpenBSD written in C, we have OctoRPKI from uh, Cloudflare, and then we have Fort um, from uh, Nick Mexico, uh, written in C as well. And the two that I normally recommend are Routinator and Fort, basically because they, they work uh, perfectly out of the box. RPKI client would also be an option. Uh, there's the, it works, of course, natively on OpenBSD, but there's the portable version on FreeBSD and on Ubuntu. Um, Octo RPKI, unfortunately, is the one that right now I would not recommend using because it's uh, um, because no one at Cloudflare is maintaining it at the moment. Um, so we have the the validators. How do we actually do the validation? We have the um, validator. The validator downloads, as we mentioned, the ROAs and the certificates using either rsync or RRDP, which is a, a protocol that's based on HTTP and uh, deltas in the different files. And it creates a validated cache. Then via RPKI RTR, it goes to the routers. Now, here we're already showing that there is a ROA validation part and the BGP origin validation part. Those are two separate uh, sides. So to more explain it, we have to look again at the chain of trust and then <coughs> think about that. The, there is the ROA validation part that's done on one side, and then there is uh, the, the data that comes out of that is used for doing this origin validation. So RFC 6811, where when I receive as a router a, a, a BGP announcement, I match it with a ROA that I have. So you see that the validator has a ROA that says AS100 as origin, 10 slash 22. I match it with what, uh, what I'm receiving, that's fine. But then if AS200 tries to, sorry, if, uh, if AS100 tries to announce it and announce a more specific slash 24, there is no covering ROA. Uh, the one that covers it says slash 22. They don't match, so that BGP announcement would be invalid. The same goes <laughs> if AS200 tries to announce 10 slash 22 because the ASN, the origin, the origin ASN doesn't match. Now, I was mentioning this. We have two parts. One is the raw validation where we figure out if the chain of trust is fulfilled or not, and then a ROA can be either valid or invalid. If it is invalid, then it doesn't get put into the validated cache. So we don't have any data about that. But if it's valid, then we pass to the next step that is the origin validation in BGP. And we have three states. The, uh, the, the first one is not found where we don't, if we don't have a ROA covering a part of the address space, what uh, the address space we're looking at, uh, we have no way of defining if it could be valid or invalid, so we define it as not found. But also, but then, if instead we have a ROA covering the address space where uh, we received an update for, we we check if the uh, ROA matches the data we received. So if the uh, origin ASN is the same, if the uh, prefix length is the same, if the max length 
covers the address, uh, the announcement that we're looking at. And then if everything matches, then the BGP origin validation status becomes valid. If there is something that is not right, then everything becomes invalid. And so based on this, we can configure our routers to be, to say, if uh, a prefix is invalid in origin validation, discard it because it might be a typo. It might be someone trying to hijack someone else's address space, something like that. <clears throat> For now, the problem is that most of the address space, so 65% is uh, not found. There is no covering row. If we were to be in a perfect world, we would have about, I don't know, 99% of the address space covered by a ROA, and then we would be able to do uh, full origin validation. Then um, imagine a situation where you have a customer who cannot reach a certain uh, network, and they really have a service they really need on that network, but that network has a ROA that's not correct. Um, so there is, in this case, AS100 announcing uh, just a slash 24, but they have a ROA that says it should be a slash 22. What you can do is you can create a, an allow list that's still called, even in the documentation, whitelist. Uh, you use a, a slurm that is a um, standard, and you inject, uh, basically you inject a fictitious ROA into your validator, into your validated cache, uh, which means that at that point, the uh, slash 24 gets accepted as a valid um, BGP announcement. Um, this is all nice and uh, it can help you in certain specific situations, but when you, when you add a uh, local change via Slurm, you should remember you want to take this out in a few days and make sure that you don't leave it there as a permanent configuration. And then um, other actions you can do, either than just discarding the uh, address space, you could tag the validated routes with a specific community and, and the not found ones with another community. This would give your routers internally uh, a way to understand um, what, what kind of validation you performed on these, um, um, these prefixes. Now, some people, <coughs> some people, what they do is they, instead of discarding the uh, BGP announcement for invalid routes, they tag them with a specific community and then null route them. That's also a valid way, but the recommended way would be to just uh, discard those, uh, those BGP announcements. Um, I would say we have reached a point where um, from now on, th there are three small sections. One is BGP SAC, one is AS cones, and one is um, um, ASPA. These are three additions to RPKI that, um, well, in the case of BGP SAC, this is a, uh, an ITF standard already. Uh, uh, AS cones and ASPA are drafts. Um, so I would stop here because we are almost 40 minutes over time. And uh, it's also getting pretty late here. Um, but if you're interested, we can uh, maybe set up another session later on and then we can go over these three, uh, three parts. But I think for now we're three hours and 40 minutes into the, into the tutorial and uh, Maybe we want to uh, get some final questions and uh, wrap it up. Although there are no questions about RPKI. No. Um, you're muted, Tom. What tools do you use to take the RPKI feeds uh, and apply it to bird slash open BGBD? Config. So um, the chain is you run the uh, you run a validator. I run two actually. I always run two in in each pop. I have um, there's uh, I run one routinator and one fort. And I know Yob doesn't like this because he would like me to use RPKI client. Um, 
but uh, so you you do those, and then you have in Bird, uh, but also in um, in OpenBGPD, you have basically an additional table that's the ROA table, and then it gets used as a to to check against the BGP announcements. What happens? You know the saying. It's, uh, this is a Boeing seven three seven related issue. So a person with one watch thinks they know the time. A person with two watches is never sure. And so a person with three watches probably has a good idea, you know. Um, so if you run two validators and they disagree, which validator do you take? It depends on the implementation. So, for example, I was, uh, I was building labs with FRR recently, and FRR lets you define preference for uh, one validator over the other. Um, uh, if you check the, if you check how BERT treats it, BERT does a, an end of the, basically of the two uh, validator sessions. So it looks at all the prefixes you received from all the row, uh, the VRPs you received verified into the page from uh, both the validators, and then it tells you which one it applies to, which protocol, basically, because BIRD calls, uh, calls them protocols. Um, um, then it depends on the implementation, because we, it, this is a question I get pretty often. Like, what happens if one uh, validator says one thing and the other says another? And then which one do you trust? Some implementations trust one, and then say the other, I would only uh, check its data. I will only check its data if the first one dies. If I lose connection to the first validator, then I'll talk to, I'll get all the data from the second. Um, but it really depends. So uh, FRR says one, uh, give me a preference, one, two, three, four. Uh, Bird keeps them both. So you see, if you look at the table generated by Bird, it uh, tells you, uh, same as the BGP table, like I got the same prefix from these validator and the other, or I got this prefix only from one validator. So it really depends. Okay. Um, does anyone else, th thanks Rax for answering my question. Does anyone else well, have any other questions before? Um, no. No, it's uh, it's been a, it's been a good uh, presentation. Um, I've taken a bit out of it. And I've got some ideas to move forward with. So, um, yeah, thank well you. Well done, uh, both Max and uh, everybody here. Tom, you know, you hear some more DMs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all.